Good morning. Welcome to day two of the Native Prairie Restoration Reclamation Workshop. My name is Caitlin Rosiler, and I'm the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. This morning's session is water. We started talking about potential themes and topics during the summer when we were planning this event. I want to make sure to include water as a topic this year, especially with the year's drought that we've been experiencing. So I'm really looking forward to this session. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we're on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. I'd also like to thank our event sponsors. Our platinum sponsors are Trace Associates and the Mosaic Company. And this event wouldn't be possible without the support of our gold sponsors, Canadian Wildlife Service, CN, Crescent Point Energy, Eastern Irrigation District, Enbridge, Faculty of Science, the University of Regina, and North American Helium. Our sponsors this year are Nutrien and Brett Young. And we're grateful for the ongoing support from our bronze sponsors, Truex Company and Tannis Conservation Services. This year, our participant sponsors, I. Whiteson Innovations and the Society for Range Management Prairie Parkland chapter have allowed people to attend this event that may not have otherwise been able to. So we're really grateful for that. Uh, before we get into the sponsor greetings, I'd like to remind you that you can type in questions at any time into the Zoom Q&A box and speakers will be answering questions at the end of their presentations. The Q&A chat box in Feed Loop will not be moderated, so be sure to put your questions in the Zoom chat box. The Feed Loop one is just for general event networking. Um, you have two more days to find gamification codes and there's still some big prizes left, so make sure to scoop them up before uh, the end of day today and end day tomorrow. And just a reminder, we have case studies going on this afternoon. You can pick which case study you would like to actively engage in. Uh, the two case study presentations and discussions will be recorded and be able to be viewed later. Um, so if you don't have time to actively participate this week, you can watch the recordings later. Any handouts that you might need to complete the case studies will be available on the event platform. The discussion group is called Student Meet and Greet, and it will not be recorded. Uh, so if you want to check that out, be sure to head over there. And although we call it a student meet and greet, it's um, open to anybody who's looking for employment opportunities and um, any job seekers out there. It's not just for students. Now, I'd like to invite Carrie Hacker from Environment and Climate Change Canada, Canadian Wildlife Service. CWS is a gold sponsor for the event this year, and we've been lucky to have CWS as a sponsor again. They've been a longtime supporter and contribute, contributor to the Native Prairie Restoration Reclamation Workshop. I'd like to pass it over to Carrie Hacker. Hi there. Thank you for the opportunity to say a couple of words. So, yes, I uh, represent Environment and Climate Change Canada who is the Federal uh, Ministry of Environment, federal regulator uh, because of that. So there's components of the Fisheries Act, the Mike Birds Convention Act, Canada Wildlife Act, Impact Assessment Act, Species at Risk Act, all of those, which I won't go on about. Um, we also are involved a little more uh, nitty gritty. Um, we do species at risk recovery planning. There's a number of different funding programs through Environment Canada for everything from wetlands to species at risk projects to uh, habitat, indigenous conservation, protected areas. There's all kinds of things that are funded through Environment Canada. Myself, I actually work in protected areas, which includes the national wildlife areas and migratory bird sanctuaries across Canada. And as such, uh, I work at Last Mountain Lake National Wildlife Area. We have a pretty long history of restoration uh, at the larger scale. So back in 1994, 1995, uh, we actually put back our first 60 acres of native prairie mix. And that was something we were actually trying to replicate the original native prairie plant community that had been in this area. It's my first job with a shiny new biology degree and uh, to recreate a plant community was a really big challenge and very exciting. I've been working off and on uh, in this field ever since. And my goodness, uh, we've been building our ability to do this over time. The loss of habitat is one of the biggest threats to the prairie ecosystem and all the species that depend on it. Fragmentation of that habitat is a close second. The ability to actually recreate native prairie, to rehabilitate it, to actually put it back 
on the ground and make it suitable habitat. That's a pretty amazing ability. And that is what the Native Prairie Restoration Reclamation Workshop is all about. That's why we support it. So everything from site preparation to what seed mix to put in, what to put in with the seed mix, how to manage it post planting with mowing, grazing, perhaps even prescribed fire. Our abilities are getting better and better over time. When we start adding in some other components other than just what seeds do you put in the ground, now we're starting to get into what the soil needs to be like. Biocrusts, the mycorrhizal fungal or fungal community. What else is included that will actually make a big difference to plant community and the community of microbes, microorganisms, wildlife, birds, everything that depends on it. So I challenge you all at this conference, learn, enjoy this, make new contacts, be inspired. What we do is pretty amazing. What we have the ability to do is quite frankly, astonishing uh, from when I started 27 years ago. We can actually make a difference. So learn what you can. And uh, Environment Canada, Canadian Wildlife Service is really pleased to support this. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite Megan Rennie, who will be introducing this morning's speaker on behalf of platinum sponsor Trace Associates. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, so as she mentioned, I'm Megan Rennie with Trace Associates, and I'm here to introduce our first speaker, Rob Gardner. So Rob Gardner has supported the conservation of Alberta's grassland since moving to Medicine Hat 40 years ago. Over this period, he has explored most of southeastern Alberta and many other parts of the northern Great Plains. His leadership has helped create several organizations including the Prairie Conservation Forum and Society of Grasslands Naturalists. He enjoys observing the paradox of wetlands in the dry mixed grass prairie and understanding the critical role these play in our ecosystem. Well, thank you, Megan, for that introduction. And uh, uh, I do find uh, the wetlands uh, a paradox. It's a, a, a surprise, and yet it shouldn't be because in a dry country, every drop of water is just that much more important. Now, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. And So I hope everybody's able to see that now. Yes, that's perfect. Good. Uh, I enjoyed the, the presentations yesterday uh, and uh, it, it got me thinking more about restoration because I don't think of my project necessarily as restoration. And yet I realized that uh, when you're trying to restore a landscape or part of a landscape or species, you have to restore it to something. And uh, the time frame that you're restoring it to makes a real difference as to what you do with it and how you get there. Uh, we heard about people uh, that are restoring uh, abandoned farmland uh, back to a, a native prairie, uh, the way Megan was just describing, or Carrie rather. And, uh, uh, but more recently, we have people talking about how to restore a, a pipeline uh, or industrial facility that may have been initially disturbed 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, the restoration I'm talking about dates back 200 years. It dates back to when the very first Europeans and their influence came to the prairies and, uh, and changed the, the grassland almost irrevocably. Uh, and it's taken 200 years for parts of it to recover and uh, we can help the rest of it recover. I'm speaking of the streams here uh, that uh, if some of us may have uh, 
our grandparents' photo albums, and uh, we can flip through them sometimes and see what the landscape looked like when they first uh, moved here, generally in the period 1900 to 1920 or so. Uh, was, the cattle looked different. The landscape looked uh, a little barer, perhaps, but uh, pretty similar. Uh, but uh, you probably, people watching the, this presentation probably don't remember camping in willow thickets like this uh, alongside a, a clear flowing stream with trout in it. Uh, this is in the, near the foothills of southwestern Alberta, taken in 1890. That low ridge in the foreground, I believe, is the beaver dam. Uh, the beaver have been removed from there for many years, but uh, because of the beaver, you have that uh, dense uh, uh, stand of willows and small poplars, probably a few other shrubs growing on pretty fertile land. And this is what I would like to be restoring to, uh, that uh, uh, grandparents may have seen some of these, these scenes uh, with good, excellent riparian forest, uh, but by the time the homesteaders arrived in the 20s, most of the Alberta and Saskatchewan, I believe, uh, probably a lot of Eastern Montana looked a lot like this, uh, not a shrub to be seen and uh, looked bleaker than it needed to. Uh, but nothing much has changed. That was a, that is a fairly stable system. It's not getting worse, but it's not getting better either. Uh, we need to make a bit of a, an effort there. Uh, people can make management uh, decisions. And I guess I like to use a, a sports comparison here. Uh, it's a bit of a stretch for me because I'm not really a sports kind of guy, but uh, I, I know enough to know that people put together dream teams, bringing together the best players from uh, various teams, kind of an all-star. And so I'm uh, challenging landowners and land managers to build a stream team to, uh, to restore their, their streams. Now, uh, this, this stream is not terrible because it's still flowing, but uh, uh, it's in the rebuilding uh, phase of the franchise. So uh, we can give it a bit of a boost. Uh, I think this is a pretty nice looking stream. And uh, uh, we just have to uh, examine all aspects of the, the riparian area and uh, work on, them, on each of them. And I think together we can really make a big difference. So uh, I think most landowners in the Northern Great Plains, their goal will be to have more cattle grazing on the pasture and in the long term, not just uh, for a, a season or a couple of seasons, but permanently. And the reason they don't put more out there is not usually a lack of grass, it's usually a lack of water, which can be very seasonal. Uh, the, the, the water is not very well distributed, so the cattle crowd around there and don't use the far corners of the pasture. Uh, water may, may be salty or alkali, and uh, if, if cat, believe it or not, cattle actually have a sense of taste, and they, they won't drink as much as is good for them, and uh, so they don't gain as much weight as they might. But for sure, they, they pound down the area around the, the water supply, and uh, that reduces water quality even more. But I'm here to say that change is possible. Your team can improve up in the standings. So let's see how to go about doing that. Uh, we just need to uh, uh, put some thought into it. And uh, uh, as I say, protect the water at all costs. Uh, hate to have your arena burn down. That'll be uh, the end of your season. So. Cattle can be influenced. <laughs> Cattle are, are lazy. Uh, they like to crowd around the water source, but uh, they also like to eat. And so if you can uh, put your salt blocks or supplements in the far corners of the pasture, uh, when you first put the cattle into the, the field, if you uh, get on the horse and uh, move them to the back corner, they'll remember they tasted pretty good there, even though they have to come back to get some, uh, some water. So herding is, is just another way to put more fun into it. Uh, 
Fencing can be useful. In this example here, you can see the fence in the foreground, but there's also one in the background. This rancher is fenced off just to three or four acres, and he uses that for his horses. He could use it for cattle too. The fence uh, controls the, the time they're there. It doesn't necessarily keep them out entirely, just uh, for a, a managed amount of time. Uh, Rob, sorry to interrupt. The sound is a little bit choppy. I'm wondering if we could try it without your webcam on, um, just so we have better audio. Oh. Let's try that. Sure. I'm just wondering how to turn that off. Um, just at the bottom, or on mine, it's the bottom left. It says stop video. Yeah, I'm going to have um, to go out of share screen to get that, I think. No, I think okay. if you go to the top where oh, it says share, like screen sharing. Okay. A menu oh, should come down. Okay. Perfect, okay, let's try good. that. Thank you. Is that sounding any better? Yes, it is already, Maybe? thanks. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, you can get, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, get water pumps. It'll take the water out of the dugout and ranchers have told me They've watched cattle walk right through a slough up to their bellies in water uh, out the other side to get to the same slough water that's pumped up into a trough. Uh, it just tastes that much better. It's cleaner and uh, the footing is better so they're more comfortable standing there and uh, it's healthier for them too if they don't get their, keep their hooves wet all day. So there's a couple of uh, dependable players on our team that tend to get uh, missed. And uh, one is ro rest rotation grazing and one is riparian health assessment. And these work really well. And uh, uh, people, I would encourage people to use them wherever they can. Uh, if you're uncomfortable with uh, the riparian health assessment, it's a little bit formal, though it's pretty accessible. Uh, add a consultant to your team, bring in the specialist, and they can uh, help you check out your water supply and see what you should be doing, <clears throat> or at least offer some suggestions. <clears throat> this chart has different aspects of, uh, uh, of the riparian area that you score yourself. It's all self-managed. Self and uh, shrubs though are a key. <clears throat> On the uplands, people say, take half the grass and leave half the grass. In the riparian area, if you've got shrubs growing like crazy, then you've got a healthy stream. It's pretty much that simple. Uh, the other aspect that people tend not to notice because it's always been there is the stream channel incisement. Um, most of our prairie streams have eroded down about two or three meters. And that was over a hundred years ago and they're just staying there. But a scene like this uh, where the the downcut stream has drained that whole uh, flat there and uh, the quality of the forest has really declined because the water table has dropped there two meters. So you've got a lot of potential hiding there. Uh, just need to get that water table recovered. There's some uh, approaches that take a little bit more effort and uh, uh, planting willows, and using some interesting structures that we'll look at and the basic one of removing facilities from the floodplain. So these can take a little longer to show results and their payback period is a little bit longer. Willows are, uh, are pretty easy to plant and uh, uh, rule of thumb, literally, they should be as thick as your thumb and uh, about a uh, foot and a half long. Try to keep the uh, the leaf end up and the root end down uh, as they grew. And uh, rather than pounding it in, you might want to pound a crowbar in to make a hole for it and then slide it in into. Uh, so get together with some friends and have some fun planting willows. Uh, but plant them where they're going to grow. And that's a, a wet spot. Uh, don't try to plant them on the eroding bank. Uh, unfortunately, that eroding bank is, uh, is going to take many years to recover. You need to get the willows growing uh, in receptive areas that I've circled here, moist uh, mud bars, uh, 
where they'll uh, really root quickly. If you have one of those gullies that we looked at a second ago, uh, and you have some aspens on your property somewhere, whack down a, a couple of trees uh, in the 10 to 15 foot high range and uh, lie them down and make a, a very permeable dam. The water can still go through, but it'll be slowed down. And uh, then you'll start uh, getting an informal riffle forming and uh, that'll start raising the water table to slow the water down and allow it to infiltrate. Uh, these uh, suggestions are from uh, Bill Zedijk and uh, uh, Clothier, Clothier uh, book called Let Water Do the Work. I really recommend that. Uh, they work in uh, New Mexico and Arizona and they've turned uh, uh, flat out desert, uh, cactus desert into uh, productive ranch land uh, by building these structures. A lot of people have these little drops in the depressions or gullies and uh, it's easy to ignore them because they're only a foot high today. The next year they'll be uh, 14 inches and back a couple of meters and gradually they, they work their way back and, uh, and get taller. You can see downstream where the guy's standing, uh, that's not a very healthy looking riverbed. And just a couple of years ago, that used to look like the part upstream there. So it can go from uh, marginal to bad to worse in just a few years. So this is called a head cut. Uh, it's probably caused by cattle, uh, uh, a cattle trail going across and starting a bit of erosion. But uh, you can try dumping garbage in there. I've seen people put broken, broken machinery or concrete or whatever, and they don't work. The wire still gets around. Uh, the way to deal with it is to actually cut that back mechanically with a shovel or something like that and pave it with uh, about a four or five foot stretch for one this size of, of stones that are maybe uh, 10 inches to a foot in diameter. Uh, and this, you get this effect, it curves up a bit on the side to keep the, the high water in the channel, keep it from eroding around the edge. And then gradually the, the uh, Soil will fill in, vegetation will grow in the soil, and you'll get a, a stabilized uh, drop in the elevation. Some people try to protect their eroding banks with a, uh, uh, a structure, and it almost always points the wrong way. They should be pointing upstream, which uh, seems a little counterintuitive, but it's the way uh, to slow things down. Uh, you can imagine that the water bumping into this thing, some of it's going to flow towards the right-hand shore and stop, and all the silt will drop out of that, and you'll get a, a buildup of a, a mud bank there. The other water will be pushed to the left bank, where it says receding, and you might think that's a bad thing, but it's not. It's actually a good thing. There's nothing wrong with erosion. The, the problem is... There's no place for deposition. Erosion and deposition are two sides of the same coin. And you just want to have a space for deposition behind that vein where the eddies will curl around and the mud will get deposited. And then you put another one on the other side uh, and you get a set of you know, three, four, or 10 of these going back and forth to encourage the, the stream to get meandering, which will slow it down and allow more of that sediment to settle out. Now, obviously, you want to be talking to your uh, local watershed management group, uh, which might be Environment Canada, might be the provincial uh, or, or state water department, uh, before you do anything this <laughs> aggressive. But uh, this sort of uh, is not a dam, but it's, uh, it slows the water down and gets that deposition happening. So uh, in some cases, you can just pound in a few posts and, and that will make a big difference. It'll catch driftwood as it goes by and, and slow things down. But uh, the water and the fish are still able to go through because it's uh, completely leaky. What can I say? How many, how hard is it to understand flood plain? When people complain about damage from floods, why is there infrastructure down next to the creek? 
let's get stuff out of here. We know it's going to flood. It's called the floodplain, and whether it's sooner or later. <clears throat> so let's uh, just move on. So let's get back to where our uh, plan was taking place here. Uh, we've talked about the limitations. We talked about changing the sort of things that ranchers, landowners might be doing, uh, getting cattle to the underused parts of the past year uh, with uh, salt or, or supplements or water troughs. Uh, we've installed a few devices uh, to trap sediment. We've maybe uh, uh, given them some rest and we planted a few willows, try to get them going a little bit. So how are we doing? Well, already it's starting to bring some benefits. You get more even forage use, better drought resistance because the, the grass is in better shape, it absorbs the water better, less erosion, less disease. And uh, overall, you look to get a few more cattle while still having better land. So this, uh, this stream team here is improving. Uh, it was taken very early in the spring, but if you look carefully, you can see uh, big uh, clumps of willows growing there. Just a little bit of pink showing this early. So this is great. You can see the meandering stream. So uh, this, uh, this valley is getting uh, being improved. So the result is the stream health improves uh, if you're using that formal uh, uh, assessment. Uh, water's higher quality, flows longer, and uh, carrying capacity. And uh, beaver are even colonizing the stream, perhaps, conserving even more water. And the goal, more cattle. So at this point, your franchise is getting noticed. Your neighbors are uh, uh, noticing that your, uh, your stream is looking a little healthier. It's flowing longer. Uh, and if it's good enough, it's like a team, you need a good team to attract a real star. Some of you can uh, uh, take your team to a whole new level. Who is that? We're talking Castor Canadensis, the star. Sure, he won't play for any ranching team. He needs a certain uh, uh, riparian health before he can uh, move in and, and stay. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it's a really good investment. They really will help. Uh, all the photographs in this show that have healthy uh, riparian areas have a, a lot of beaver dams just out of the picture. So they can bring a lot of benefits. They, uh, they store substantial amounts of water. Uh, they have cheap contracts and uh, they don't need water licenses. So uh, believe it or not, they do create more habitat than they eat. And uh, the dams aren't all that big. So if any one of them blows out, it's not a big deal. But they can make a lot of dams. Every, uh, every gully could have half a dozen uh, small dams on it, each holding some water. Now, do you have to go out and plant thousands of willows 10 years ago if you want a beaver to move in and help you conserve your water? Well, not really. Uh, I found beaver growing in some, or living happily in some, uh, what most people would think were pretty stressful environments. Uh, this thing, for example, doesn't look like your typical beaver plant. Beaver looks, but get a little closer, it looks more impressive. That's a lot of cattails there. And you can see the beaver channel in the foreground. So they're doing all right. Here's a dam made of nothing but cattails and mud. And there's a lot of cattails in the, the Great Plains. They could all have beaver there. Beaver are surprising. Uh, what makes beaver valuable is not just that they hold water back, but that every dam leaks. They're not that great at waterproofing. And the leaky dam is really valuable. Uh, water comes out of it. And uh, so even after, if there's a thunderstorm yesterday overnight and filled up the, the pond, Overnight, a little bit of it drained out. So today's thunderstorm still has uh, space to be uh, uh, caught there in that pond. But uh, the water isn't wasted because it's 
flows and fills up the next dam and the next dam after that. So you can see there's quite a, a, a whole chain of ponds up this very short, narrow uh, coulee. Uh, the, one of the bottom is clear, but you can see the green lines going across this uh, valley floor. And I can see about half a dozen ponds in this in just in less than a half a kilometer. And uh, in high water, the, wa uh, the times of high water, uh, the water table recharges, time to low water, it soaks out of the land into the creek, keeps it flowing, keeps those ponds nearly full, and, uh, and gives everybody uh, more water to use. Another early spring photo, you can see all the willows here. Uh, they're supported with just a, a very small dam or comparatively small dam, and that's pushed the water out across that floodplain. And in the middle, mid to background there, you can see all the sagebrush growing. It's pretty heavy. People don't realize that sagebrush is actually a, a riparian species in Alberta and Saskatchewan, at least. And uh, it needs to get its roots down into the water table to grow really well. And it's able to do that in this situation. It actually brings some of the water to the surface, uh, and other plants are able to make use of it through the mycorrhizal connections that they make underground. Now, I just turned 90 degrees after taking this picture and looked downstream uh, the same site uh, to see what was there. Well, we got trees. Well, they're able to make use of that uh, steady flow of water out of the beaver dam complex and, and to keep growing. And the beaver haven't whacked them down the way most people feel they would. Beaver work their way upstream from their dam, not downstream. But if you look at the sagebrush, you can see it's nowhere near as healthy. That water table downstream has been uh, lowered by several meters uh, through the incisement there. And uh, you can see that uh, it's not doing nearly as well. As compared to this one with active beaver ponds, beaver dams, and uh, doing pretty well. So I was talking about restoration, but beaver have been gone in, to a large extent for 200 years. So you have to look a little bit more carefully uh, just to get people tuned in a little bit as to what they can be looking for. I think we'd agree this was a beaver dam. If you look in the top left corner, you can see a stump with fresh wood chips on it. Uh, so that's fine. This is just next to my house really. Uh, and four months later, this is what it looked like after a summer of very high water, washed away all the loose stuff, but it still left that uh, ridge across the stream, which will be a foundation for the next dam that comes along. Then if you're hiking around, not too far away, I found this. This looks pretty much the same, eh? So this is a, I'm interpreting this as a, an ancient beaver dam that's probably over a hundred years old. Uh, and there's a, an adjacent neighbor of it just a few meters away. Again, if you look in the very top left corner, you can see that uh, mushroom willow sitting there. It's been browsed back by the cattle. And if we take a close look at that, we can see there's uh, beaver chewings, but there are several vintages of beaver chewing. Some of them are very old, like uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years old and some are uh, quite fresh from a new beaver cycle starting. So once the beaver arrive, they chew off the shrubs and some of the trees to make a dam and a lodge. And we're familiar with that sort of thing. And uh, the increased water level uh, encourages more shrubs to grow over a bigger area. And as the water, as the dam gets taller, the water's pushed out onto the floodplain and it gets exponentially bigger. <clears throat> The weak part of a dam is at the end because they can't push the sticks into the, the bank very well. So the water sneaks around the end and causes some erosion. And eventually uh, this or slumping will start on the side of the valley. And if you're watching the pictures, nearly all these valleys have a little bit of slumping happening. Not a lot, but a little bit. and just keeps widening the, uh, the valley, making it a little bit flatter and uh, a little easier for plants to grow. So the, the ponds do eventually silt up 
And uh, here's one that was recently drained and uh, has a remarkable amount of silt in it. Uh, the, the dam at in the lower left there is about five feet high and uh, on the upfield, upstream side, it's only a foot high. So they've uh, raised the bottom of the, uh, the stream by four or five feet and uh, the water table with it. So after a few years, uh, the beaver pond will become very well vegetated. You can see the dam in the lower left, uh, but the lush vegetation right across there. I have to take my word for it, but these really are beaver dams. You can see beaver chewed sticks embedded in both of them. And this valley is very short, uh, but uh, it's still looking pretty lush, even though the beaver have been gone for 20, 30, or 40 years. So if a beaver was to find that site, they would be pretty pleased with all the shrubs and they would uh, start building, re renovating the dam and uh, start that cycle again. If you think of that happening, even just once a century, which is not very often, that means it could have had a hundred cycles since the glaciers left. And that's enough to make a real change to your topography. And it's an upward spiral of fertility. Uh, the more beaver ponds there are, they're embedding the, the, the wood and other organic material into the mud in the bottom, and it becomes an excellent soil. Uh, so this is a, a valley that had beaver ponds in it 200 years ago, I believe. And uh, over the years of, of drier conditions after the beaver dams dried up, uh, the willows and dogwood have changed to rose and, uh, and snowberry. But uh, uh, just to remind you, let's go back to that other picture of the valley with the dams. See those dams there? Can you see those dams there? I hope so. Here's a pretty uh, recent beaver dam. You can see the new willows starting to grow up and the cattle glad to have some, uh, some fresh water close at hand. It'd be even better if there's a pump pushing it up onto that flat there. There's some willows. Oh, beaver will jam your culverts. Yes, they will. That's because culverts are the engineer's gift to beaver. And the, <clears throat> the reason for that is that engineers and a lot of landowners will cheap out. They'll make the culvert as small as they can uh, instead of as big as they can. If the culvert is narrower than the stream, you'll get the stream focused into it. It'll start making a rushing noise that the beaver just go, drives the beaver crazy. They'll do anything to stop that splashing noise, including filling your, uh, your culvert up. But we're, we people are smarter than them rodents. And I think we can do something about it. Uh, there's plans for this on the internet, but just briefly, uh, you put a pipe through the middle of the dam. You don't get rid of the dam. Uh, you protect the inlet from being jammed by beaver stuff. And you, you make the outlet so it doesn't splash and it keeps it at a defined level that the landowner can live with. An alternate, not quite as sophisticated, but a lot cheaper and faster build a fence around the inlet. So the beaver has to dam up the whole perimeter of that fence, not just uh, the culvert. And uh, this works pretty well and it's certainly a lot faster. Uh, again, the Mustakis Institute there has a, uh, a video on how to do this. Now, getting back to our team, there's, there's non-small operations in every professional team. And that's, <laughs> Let's say a code word for beer, popcorn, and merchandise. Uh, what are the non-ranching uh, operations, non-cattle operations in a ranch? Uh, ecological goods and services, things that may not directly support the, the ranch, but indirectly they certainly could. Uh, beaver have a tremendously positive impact on the ecosystem beyond just the water. Uh, this is a uh, symbolic or schematic look at a stream. It's a pretty simple, most streams are pretty simple ecosystem, just a water trickling along through a narrow band of, of grass or maybe cattails. Uh, <clears throat> then the beaver moves in, builds a dam, suddenly you've got deep water, which uh, is, is good enough to hold uh, 
over the, the long dry summer and becomes a refuge for fish. Uh, although dams restrict the passage of some fish, especially non-native fish, but they usually have water flowing over them every year so the fish can move around. The branches and other wood gets uh, put into the pond, either as a food supply or just uh, as part of the dam and uh, significant amounts of carbon. <clears throat> got the species that like the open water and you've got the species that like the shoreline. This beaver dig their channels and canals leading away from the pond. There's a lot more amphibians. And the moist meadow around the edge of the pond is exactly what young sage grouse need to survive. This has been identified as a, a deficiency in sage grouse uh, life history and a cause of uh, severe mortality at a, a young age. And yet people haven't caught on to building beaver ponds to, uh, to support them. <clears throat> so with uh, the shrubs that are growing up, you've got lots of shelter and, and food for migrating birds, small mammals, and larger ungulates moving in. Uh, so many of Medicine Hat, where I live, uh, Many berries out in the Baldass Prairie has a moose hunting season because of the, the streams they've got there. Uh, if there were trees in the valley beforehand, they've probably died, drowned, uh, but they're not finished. They're still providing valuable wildlife services. Those eroding banks I talked about are a place where uh, many wildflowers can get going and also uh, homes for uh, bank swallows, kingfishers, uh, and other small animals. So the uh, complexity of the habitat allows uh, sort of mid-sized predators like bobcat, mink, weasels uh, to flourish there, uh, adding another layer of complexity. And of course, the sediment accumulates. So overall, you, you could have a really quite a complex ecosystem there. And uh, being complex, it makes itself more stable and requires less maintenance. Oh, where would our team be without, without the fans? Uh, well, we don't particularly want uh, private boxes and soft chairs, but uh, uh, perhaps ecotourism would, would be another way to go, another way to uh, keep the next generation on the ranch, uh, bring a few people out here and show them what's happening. And don't forget the fans really are important. Someone has to be buying that beef and uh, we want to want them to associate ranches and ranching with a, a healthy, uh, environmentally friendly activity, uh, not a negative thing. So I hope you're even more enthusiastic about maintaining streams uh, and giving them a little bit more attention. Uh, just as a review here, uh, is this your green stream? Does anybody have a stream like this? Uh, or is this more what you want your stream to look like? This looks like a winner to me. And the amazing thing is these photos are the same stream, less than one kilometer apart, less than a month apart. Uh, so your coaching does make a big difference. Uh, this is a management issue. It's not a, a God's gift to the rancher issue. So, it is possible to move higher in the standings with your, your stream team and uh, to get more, more permanent water and more cattle grazing. Now, if you've been doing some of this already and if I'm preaching to the converted, uh, that's terrific. Uh, I hope that you'll, you'll send a, a picture of your, uh, your stream that you're proud of and uh, enter it in the Riparian Hall of Fame. Uh, send me a, an email and tell me where, where your stream is and if you're doing anything special to encourage that, or if it just happened through your natural good management. So there's my email, gardener at telusplanet.net. And uh, I think that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. That was awesome. Uh, we have a couple questions here right now. And to all of our attendees out there, if you have any questions for Rob, just uh, type it into the Q&A section um, on the Zoom 
dashboard there. Uh, so Rob, the first question is from Shirley and she says, very cool information. Can you describe the mechanics of the alternative to drilling through a beaver dam? It looked like a big cage placed in the body of the channel. Where in the channel should that be placed? A pinch point? Well, uh, with the pond leveler there, uh, it is a significant project. Uh, the, the pipe should be at the level, the, the maximum level the rancher or landowner can, uh, can live with. Uh, that's where the water level will become. And it won't be at the top of the dam because you already decided that was too high. So uh, it means bringing in a backhoe, tearing out the top two or three or four feet of the dam, uh, using a portable post pounder to pound in some steel supports for that pipe install the pipe. This can take several days and, uh, and you know, half a dozen people. Uh, and then just dump a bunch of stuff back on top of the pipe where the dam used to be. The beaver will fix it up and uh, just, he'll, he'll try to fix it up, but he'll realize soon it's not doing any good. He'll patch around the pipe itself, but uh, your, uh, your pond will be at that fixed level from then on. Awesome, thank you for that answer. Um, for some of your images, do you use drones or is it primarily just from an elevated location? You beautiful pictures, by the way. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the compliment there. Uh, these, uh, unless they're otherwise credited, they're my pictures. And no, I don't have a drone. So these are all just taken from uh, uh, standing on the side of the valley. Awesome, thank you. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming in. So uh, Jessica is wondering, how can we get ranchers to do field visits to show what the landscape looks like and the improvements? Um, does Saskatchewan or other provinces have the capability to get ranchers on the landscape? You mean on other people's landscape? Yeah, like I think the, the two images that you showed right now, the same stream a kilometer apart, a month yeah. apart, um, is very powerful. Is there, have you ever been able to get anyone out there to kind of see the difference and, and try to make some management changes on their land? Well, um, it's, it's a challenge and that's why I'm doing this sort of presentation here. Uh, I've put that, those two photographs on a simple poster, I've put it around in a rural post offices a little bit, kind of like a wanted poster. And uh, uh, haven't had much feedback, no. And uh, what I want to emphasize is that change is possible and that you don't need to be feel, feel embarrassed. Modern ranchers have not caused this problem. This was caused 200 years ago when the beaver were trapped out by the Hudson Bay Company and their employees. Uh, and not by the Aboriginal people, actually. The Prairie Aboriginal people uh, refused to participate in the fur trade other than supplying them with, uh, with pemmican for food, but they wouldn't trap beavers because they knew how important they were to their own livelihood. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the next question is uh, from anonymous attendees. They say, very interesting presentation. I'm interested in how you've navigated permitting um, for in water work. Permitting. Um, yeah. Most of this doesn't involve actually manipulating the channel. Uh, it just involves uh, manipulating your cattle, fencing, uh, supplements, whatever. Uh, but I did emphasize and I continue to that you need to be in touch with your, your water and your environment uh, department. Uh, they're happy to cooperate. Uh, and I think it was mentioned earlier, they actually have grants for doing some of this. If you can document endangered species, uh, will be supported by it, and, or even in general. So I certainly encourage you to work with your wildlife agencies and especially the water agencies. Uh, but I, again, uh, south of the divide, you're in a whole different situation with uh, international water as the Milk River. And that's why beaver are so handy. They don't need permits. If you can make a, your land uh, uh, attractive enough to beaver, uh, they can do a lot of the work without a permit. And yet the downstream users will benefit because the water will be more, more consistent. 
Great, thanks for that answer. Um, are there benefits to mimicking natural drainage systems and beaver dams in cities, often in urban settings, we are, see, see, we are clearing drainage channels of vegetation? Do you have any comments? Yeah. Um, there, cities try to build storm sewers that will hold the maximum amount of rain. And we're constantly discovering that uh, the intensity of rainstorms is gradually increasing over the years. And that our storm sewers are underfit. It would be a lot cheaper and easier to allow beaver to establish themselves in existing green spaces uh, and even to create green spaces for them than to dig up hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of storm sewers to expand the pipes. So uh, I do know of places, uh, I don't know, well, Saskatoon has beaver in their green spaces and encourages that. And uh, also in Calgary, they have large green spaces or environmental reserve that do have beaver and beaver, beaver dams in them. So uh, it's possible. That's great. That's right. And Clinton says, we have a very hard time with these practices as the cropland drainage processes blow out and overwhelm the beavers and anything um, we can do to preserve the riparian habitat. Have you had any luck in convincing government agencies that this is a problem and what solutions have they enacted? Well, in Alberta, we don't have uh, drainage happening very much, uh, but uh, I, I understand in Saskatchewan drainage is still a thing. Uh, I'm really surprised at that. I didn't realize Saskatchewan had so much surplus water they needed to get rid of it. Uh, maybe people will reconsider it after this past year. But uh, anyways, people can retain water on their land, I think is good. And yeah, the more we, we manipulate the landscape, uh, draining uh, sloughs, which are natural sponges, and channeling the water, it increases the amplitude of the flow, makes the, the high water way higher and makes the low water bone dry. So uh, uh, get rid of the drainage is my recommendation. Yeah, yeah, I know it's surprising to believe it's still happening. Uh, the Citizens Environmental Alliance um, is an organization that's actually hosting a drainage conference every year to try to um, promote the disadvantages of draining and, um, and just raising awareness that it's still an issue, that it's still happening. Um, the last two years, this conference has been virtual. So people who are interested to learn why drainage is happening and why we should be um, changing our practice can check out the Citizens of Environmental Alliance. They have a really good YouTube channel with all of those webinars available there. Um, and I do want to mention that uh, Laura has said in the comments, um, thanks Rob, great presentation. Um, and she says, there's a good book to read, Once They Were Hats, In Search of the Mighty Beaver by Francis Backhouse. So um, that sounds really intriguing. And that's a book I'm going to look up here too. Um, we just have a couple more minutes until we're going to wrap up. So I'll give everyone the last minute. If you want to ask Rob a question now, go for it. Um, while we're waiting for people to type in any questions, um, I want to um, just recognize uh, some of our our attendees out there, Shirley, May, Clinton, Allison, and John. Um, you guys did a really great job of just commenting during the presentation and I don't know, adding some human <laughs> aspect to a virtual event and really appreciate it. And if you check your uh, feed loop messages, there's gamification points there for you. So um, thank you for actively participating and, and keeping it normal. Um, and I do want to send a message to Chelsea from Trace Associates. Uh, you You've earned a lot of gamification points through various things. I don't think you've checked your messages yet. So I want to let you know to check your messages. Um, and <laughs> um, it looks like there's lots of people typing in that it was a really great presentation. I don't okay. see that we have any more questions. So um, Rob, I just want to thank you again for, for doing another presentation for PCAP. And I know this was a totally different audience and we really appreciate it. And I think you, you're kind of preaching to the choir on some of these things here, but you really hit the nail on the head. So thank you for sharing your, your wealth of wisdom with us today. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, Caitlin, for inviting me. And people are certainly free to contact me and uh, if they have any further questions or if they want to send in a photo of their stream.
Yes, absolutely. The uh, the Riparian Hall of Fame. That's a great idea. So um, I hope people take you up on that, Rob. Thank you. Um, to our attendees out there, we're going to take a quick five minute bio break. Uh, you can zip to the loo, get yourself a cup of coffee or tea, and we will resume here at 1030 precise. So we'll talk to you soon. Are you okay to hit record? Perfect. So next up today is Steve Tannis. Dr. Stephen Tannis has been working with the environmental industry for the past 20 years. He has extensive experience in reclamation, ecosystem management, rare species surveys, rangeland management, and wetlands. Stephen has been propagating native species for over 20 years as part of Eastern Slopes Rangeland Seeds and owns Tannis Conservation Services. He has worked on numerous reclamation projects, restoring ecosystems across Western Canada, including the restoration of fescue grasslands, bioengineering stream banks, forested reclamation, and alpine reclamation. Stephen also teaches plant identification and wetland classification courses. His PhD established a method of reestablishing foothills fescue, making it a viable species for reclamation. He has won the Alberta Emerald Award for Individual Commitment in 2011. One, as well as part of the TCS team in restoring fescue grasslands in 2014. Today, you'll be talking about phytoremediation using native wetland plants. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Steve. Well, hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as mentioned, so my presentation today is working with phytoremediation in um, water, and specifically, I'm looking at native wetland plants. This is uh, going to cover a number of different studies that I've been working on over the last, that last seven years. And so it'll be kind of an overview of different work that I've done from selenium to nutrients. And um, there are some future projects that I'll mention as well that I'm working with uh, Olds College on. So this was meant to be a joint presentation with Olds College, but unfortunately there was some conflicting um, schedules. So I'm giving the presentation by myself. So as mentioned who I am, uh, Fire Task Conservation Services, we are an environmental consulting firm, but I also own Great Plains um, Restoration Solutions, which is manufacturing of native seed harvesting equipment. This is um, equipment uh, that John Morgan originally invented. So we um, have purchased it from him and our um, prairie habitats um, equipment is now again available under the Great Plains um, company. So this is being manufactured in Alberta as well as floating island systems. So just a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the need for remediation. Why do we need it? What is phytoremediation? And then I'm going to look at some of the TCS uh, greenhouse trials. So we did some uh, specific experiments to try to prove that we could uptake selenium with native wetland plants. Um, this was expanded with those colleges work on the same subject that we partnered with. And then we moved over into nutrients after that, working with bag oats and um, a lot of agricultural use of water and the wastewater that comes out of uh, feedlots and situations like that. So we've got that kind of tiered research. Um, the first initial trials were just proving the technique. So they're not replicated, but a really nice window into what we were looking in selenium. And then I start building on that as we go into more of the scientific studies. So what is the problem? Well, contamination of water is a common global issue. We have uh, contamination of water happening in pretty much every uh, part of human life. So from mining industry, we, which has a lots of metals um, and we can hi have hydrocarbons from the hydrocarbon industry. We have many other um, areas where we have stormwater ponds and this urban influences where we can build eutrophication, we can have metals, we have many things, salts, all coming out of different uses that humans have. And this causes us problems. So eutrophication is one of the clear problems um, everybody recognizes and that's related to algae blooms. We have um, reduced water quality, depleted oxygen levels, and then we have the undesirable smells that come with that and aesthetics, and it can be dangerous depending on what algae you're getting. And this is really led by phosphorus and nitrogen, um, as well as many other constituents in the water. So as we load the water, you basically are creating a soup that is fantastic for 
life to grow in and you get undesirable things growing in it. Um, it's caused by runoff of agricultural land. So eutrophication uh, can be highly related to agricultural land uses. You fertilize heavily, the runoff goes into your ponds and you get eutrophication of your ponds and lakes. Uh, golf courses have this problem all the time. Um, most golf courses, if you go to them and you see nice clear water, it means they've been adding chemicals to their water to kill everything. And then industrial and commercial users have large issues with this as well as residential, but a lot of times our residential areas, we don't recognize it because it moves off into another pond somewhere and we're not thinking about it. <clears throat> so, so what to understand is plants use nutrients for growth. And metal, some of our metals are actually nutrients. Um, and so we have to be thinking about um, many of the contaminants as potentially fertilizer as well. So when we're thinking about this, the idea that nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfate, potassium would be taken up by plants should make sense to us. So it's just part of plant biology, they take up these nutrients. The challenge is how do we select so that we can address a problem how do we get the right plants for each of the contaminants that we're dealing with? And here's a list of some of the ones, main ones I've been working with. We've been doing sweeps of pretty much every metal um, and a number of hydrocarbon experiments that I won't be sharing as well. But these are some of the main constituents we've been working with. So how do we address um, utilizing uh, plants to pull out contaminants? Well, there's a number of ways of doing it. One way is floating island systems. They've been promoted over the last 20 years and do varying effect. They're very versatile for installation. So here's a, some of these experimental ones from Olds College in the middle picture. We threw them on and let the ducks just eat off the vegetation. So they had a 80 on it. Um, these ones we've got little fences on. Uh, this is Lethbridge County at the top here. Uh, this is the city of Lethbridge. Um, these are little uh, foam mats that they put a little wood uh, protection on to prevent the geese from pulling apart the islands and nesting on them. Where these ones are my commercial ones. <clears throat> and then we have these fences that build into them and lock in when you want them, as well as grading to make sure muskrats don't start digging through them. Uh, we found that some of the muskrats love the plants as well. And they'll dig up the roots of the plants and eat them. So you have some challenges there, but they're very versatile. You can put them on any type of pond. If you have high fluctuating water levels, you don't have to worry about the fact that the shoreline would be drowned out, any of those type of issues. Um, it really increases your surface treatment. So shoreline is a very small surface area when you have a deep pond. This allows you to treat the entire pond. And we can retrofit islands onto almost any pond. Um, and they're passive. Other than with nutrients, you may have to harvest off the material every once in a while to uh, relieve that and pull it out of the system so you don't have anything going back into the wetland system. But it's a very passive system. It doesn't require a water treatment plant. So it's great for a lot of mine closures or passive systems where you want something just to look nice and sit there. Cloning islands have had problems though. And these plot problems are very, very distinctive and large challenges. Island sinking, um, flotation. So some of these foam ones are fantastic but we've had situations where animals have been able to get into the, through the fabric, coating them, and they're just foam. And it pulled them apart and they've sunk or they've just flown away a bunch of little bits of plastic all over the place. Um, we've had other ones out of um, another commercial one that the, they were, weren't like this little square test island, but they were octagonal and they didn't have any growing medium on them. They also all sank after three years. So these type of challenges, um, led me to start building our own islands um, because we were having problems and with mines, we couldn't afford to have things sink or not grow plants. These foam ones we've had, holes, we had three years of irrigation on the island and still the plants weren't getting water. So the water was not waking up the plant roots properly. And that's a problem too. You want to, and it could be climatic issues. Um, just some of these situations are not good in our climate. Um, this is a nesting island here. Um, there's a grating around here so the animals can't get into it. And the plants can grow up to a few, three, four inches before the geese can graze them. And it's built for nesting, to basically deter the um, geese from going onto the other islands. You give them somewhere to nest. So we, we look at some of these issues and see if we can mitigate them. 
Um, now, once we figure out a platform where we're gonna plant the plants, the bigger question is what plants should we use? There's a lot of research out there on cattail. Um, that is pretty much the popular species worldwide to study. The problem is cattails do not grow in all environments. They're not desirable in all environments. And depending on what your contaminants are, they not, may not be nearly as effective as other species. So with Olds College, I wanted to look at what species work the best. And when I was working with some of the mines, we would sweep through 30 different species testing every plant species that naturally grow on the mine in the water to test which ones we should be promoting in our constructed systems. And the bigger question then is, will they be shoreline species or floating islands? I find cattail generally in the floating islands I work with that replicate a fen system are not as effective on the islands, but they're really good on the shoreline. So I usually don't use them on the islands where I use some of the large sedges and mare's tail. There's a number of, um, I've had um, marsh marigold, all kinds of things we grow on the islands. And then how much do they remove of each contaminant? So the uses, stormwater ponds, very common, settling ponds for mines. We've done, uh, I think, almost 1,500 square meters on mines. Dugouts, uh, we put a few on dugouts. Um, it's a great way to just pull some of that algae bloom if you've got a lot of nutrients loading into your dugout. Uh, sewage lagoons, um, that's one I haven't done, but others have. Constructed wetlands, and this is where you can work in your urban areas as well as in your industrial environments where you can use constructed uh, wetlands. Wills College has a cascading pond set that they research um, with High Plains Industrial Park. And we can actually clean the water to the point then we can reuse it for industrial use and not waste it. Uh, stormwater treatment, this is really an important area that a lot of people have worked in. And then we can work in upland soils as well as in wet natural wetlands. So there's some things we can do in upland soils very effectively, but I've been focused more on the water side. So what, what do we do with the plantings? So floating islands I mentioned. Shoreline plantings is the first place they tell everybody to go to. If you've got a dugout, water levels are not fluctuating that much. Utilize shoreline plantings. That is your cheapest way to get treatment. So you select the right species and make sure your shoreline is planted. Then uh, you can actually go to constructed systems where you have these shore shallow water beds. And basically it's based a constructed wetland where you have this shallow wetland where water floods in and it'll be only a few centimeters deep up to 15 20 centimeters and then cascades out into another pond and that area becomes a treatment area that you can just have sedges uh, any other rushes that you're using for um, contamination removal and they can filter out the water and we know that wetland plants do this filtering that's fairly well established so it's a really great way utilize plants in a design swales where you instead of having a rock a riprap ditch have a vegetated swale that actually can pull out those nutrients before it even gets to your water and then stream channel plantings which we did on some of these mine operations so the first trial that i'll be talking about is this uh, greenhouse trial that we ran in our native plant nursery this is not a replicated trial this was basically uh, proof of concept to see if selenium could be removed by these plants. Uh, this was, we'd done some literature reviews. We said, well, there's potential here. We had some plants that they said could be volatilizing selenium out of the water, which is the ideal because then your selenium goes atmosphere and is a micronutrient, not basically the solution is get concentrations down. So if you can remove the concentration that's dangerous, put it to a low level, selenium becomes an actual useful. Um, constituent in your um, diet of your animals. We actually supplement selenium to cattle in Southern Alberta for white muscle seeds. So selenium is important. It's just when it's too high, it's toxic. So how do we get it back to that beneficial level? So we tested eight species. So this was, um, first we tested about 15, 20 species in the field where we just took samples, looked for selenium content in them while they were growing in the selenium contaminated water. We took some of the best species that looked like they were promising that they had uptake and then selected a few others that we just thought would be good species as well. And then 
we want to determine uptake into the vegetation as well as removal in the water. So this is a depletion experiment. So we'd spike these tanks and then look at depletion. Now, being that we wanted to look at field conditions, we decided to create something where we were using a natural growing medium. We used a peak growing medium with the goal of replicating what you find in a fan where you have natural soil materials. There's a non-woven geotextile fabric or like this mesh that we put at the base. This one here is a mesh at the base with a coconut fiber and the soil just sits on top of that. And the plant roots just go straight into the water column underneath. So it allows the plants to grow right into water. When sitting in the water, you can see it's really soupy and wet. So this is meant to be for wetland plants. We started growing all the plants and this is kind of what it looked like. We used rainwater, we did not fertilize. So this was a very low nutrient environment because on mine, this was going to be going into a mountain mine where it was low nutrient conditions other than they might have excess nitrogen from blasting. But generally it was gonna be a low nutrient situation. So we need to be testing plants in low nutrient conditions. And you can see our cattail are not that tall in here or in the back here. The sedges are easily biomass producing better than them. Same as our bulrush. So low nutrients do not benefit all species and you have to be thinking about that. That is one of the takeaways from this experiment. So we had, here's our species we tested, Carex atheroides, Juncus tenuis, Carex bebei, Juncus balticus, Scirpus validus, Carex aquatilis, and utriculata. This is a mixed tank. Um, and then Typha latifolia, just so that we could get the species in because this was more proof of concept than anything else. This is what the plants look like when they were growing in the situation. You see, Paris baby uh, is really effective um, in growing in these type of conditions. Same with Carex atherides, our other big sedges, quadless here and utriculata on this side. Junk is tenuous, um, less um, successful. Baltic rush was quite successful. And then you can see the cattails not nearly as successful in low nutrient conditions so with rainwater and spiked selenium, it's not doing great. So we spiked with uh, sodium selenate. This was our method to get in selenium. I'm looking at another replicated large experiment where we're gonna do full replication and we will be looking at a lot more selenium going into the system, but this was a fairly low level, but it still was a concentration way above what would be safe for animals to drink the water. So the goal was to see what we could do with removal. So we spiked the tank and sampled the water, and then we monthly sampled to see what would happen. And we started with plugs of plants. So the plants were small starting. And as the plants grew, we started to see reductions happening. And the plants kind of maximized in size down in this um, March to April period, but they had already depleted the um, selenium fairly effectively. This is Carex atheroides and one that we found that the content of selenium in the plant was also low. It appears that it's one of the volatilizing species, but we're not 100% positive because we haven't done all the work on that, but it seemed that the selenium disappeared from the tank and the plant. So there is potential that's what was happening. And we have some other um, results that it's one of our best species for selenium removal overall, just for its growth habit in poor nutrient conditions. Um, junk is tenuous, very similar projection. You're gonna see this. Every species had a very similar effect. Carex bebei, um, Juncus balticus, it plateaued a little higher. So it didn't pull um, the selenium down quite as low. Scirpus validus, again, it wasn't able to get quite as low, but it was doing pretty well by the end. Uh, Carex aquatus utriculata, this one was an interesting where we had a little bit of a bump. This could be error because we didn't have replication, remember? So our error bars are not in here. And so this may be just all equal in actual fact. Uh, then we have typhalatifolia and it had one of the lowest at the end. So what we see, um, the ones that got within 0 0.01 milligrams of the guidelines. So we have um, a number of these. So four species that took it almost right to the guidelines to be safe release water at that concentration. You wouldn't have to dilute it at all. So those species are effectively able to deal with this. <clears throat> and there was a fair amount of water for the size of plants. 
then looking at uh, greatest decreases. And because we had a few of these that's when we were uh, adding end up a little higher concentrations, uh, Scripus validus and Carex babii had the highest reductions, but that is likely linked to the fact that they had a little higher starting point. So if we'd given some of these other ones higher starting points, they may have been able to deal with more as well. So um, we assessed the effects of various parameters. We looked through the analysis and then um, and we went to another experiment where we said, well, why don't we actually look for some replications so we can actually say something about this. And this is where I started working with Olds College. And we had a really interesting experiment here. This is a lab experiment. Um, it is in a greenhouse, but what we did was we grew outside of water. So these plants are in perlite. We had uh, Holland, Holland does a solution that is the hydroponic nutrient solution that we added. And we basically ran that solution into the plants. So be there would be nutrient filled water and selenium moving into the plants and out of them, or just nutrients at all times. And that way they're getting replenished all the time. And so this was an experiment to see how much we could load into the plants. Instead of depleting it out of the water column, we're trying to load um, the plants up as much as we can. So these plants had ample nutrients and um, selenium, and we wanted to see what their uptake potential was. So I show this is cattail. Here is um, scurpus pungens. So we worked with scurpus pungens here, and you see how it increased versus the cattail. It really didn't do too much in this condition. Cattail is a little more finicky in some of these weird lab conditions. And I'm working with um, cattail for sol sulfoline removal. And again, it's, it's a different species for this. So it doesn't work in all situations. And here's our final one, Kerxathrates, which was one of those good performers that we really liked. So when we look at the effect, uh, the light red is the with selenium. Light, so light colors are all with selenium. The darker ones that were supposed to be dotted but aren't showing up are without. So with, when we add selenium, we had a drop here in the cattail height, no real effect on the bulrush, and we have a drop in the sedge height. When we looked at selenium and tillering, we have uh, selenium bulrush with selenium versus bulrush without. The bulrush actually expanded with the selenium. It did better in tillering. So it wasn't affected in heights, and it actually tillered more. So it reached the full plant height that was possible either way, and it actually benefited. There's more biomass of it. So this bulrush in a prairie situation may be a good one for selenium removal. Um, not as much in mountains where it doesn't grow as well. Um, cattail, on the other hand, was pretty, there wasn't much difference in the tillering, but we did see a little bit of um, differences um, in it. And then in the, um, sedge here, it was very um, similar. So those two in tillering really weren't hugely affected. So like I said, scurvous pungens had some benefit. It seemed to perform quite well when you gave it ample nutrients. Um, it seemed to deal with selenium fairly well um, in its growth metrics. So it's not negatively affected by it, where there was slight negative effects with cattail and carexathorides. <clears throat> the selenium content in the plants, we were finding the sedge, Kerxathrates had the highest content. So it was more accumulating more. Um, and we had, I believe it was something around eight replications for each one of the treatments with, with or without. So uh, we had some decent replication that way to push it into plants. Um, but yeah, you can see we are uptaking in comparison to, um, and the less than one is less than detection limit. So it could have been much, much lower. We just can't say with this uh, test that it was run. So in real world um, work, um, we attempt to improve the water quality in these uh, ponds. We've got, done this for six years. We have full uh, implementation on some of these mine ponds. AER approval, Alberta Energy Rig later approval for the technique. And we are testing the water at inlets and outlets, and you test them at the same time, inlet and outlet, and look at the water that enters and water that exits. And over the like over a year, you're seeing um, significant reductions. I can't really say numbers because I can't share that study. It's industry study, but um, there is significant impacts. 
and then the islands here being launched straight on ice. So we, we launched them right onto ice um, on these mines in the mountains. So then expanding from this, I did some work with Olds College and this is the main uh, research experiment with Olds College. And this is where we are looking at nutrient loading. So this will be probably more interesting for some people in the effect that we can get in nutrients. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of applications here. And this is where using native wetland plants can really benefit us. So we looked at uh, two experiments in a row. The first one was using that same uh, hydroponic solution. So we loaded nutrients at about five, four or five times what you normally would need and looked at a depletion experiment. So this is similar to our original experiment this is depletion based. So you have tanks, you load the nutrients in and then see what happens. So what we did in these ones, instead of, we learned from our previous experiments, we grew the plants out for three, four months before we started the experiment. And they were just grown out with rainwater or tap water, something very much low nutrient, but let the plants get to a mature enough size that they rooted through the islands. And then we spiked it with nutrients to see what they could do. And here, this is, you can see the Carex athroides here, Carex aquadilus here. Um, I've never seen these sedges this big. The cattail got, I think, almost 14 feet high. Um, so we really push nutrients into these experiments. So this is an indoor, and then we are expanding. The second run was with feedlot water, and then we're working right now, we're working on feedlots to actually work on their ponds outdoors. So this is from the cattail from the second trial here. So the controlled greenhouse trials took uh, five months, um, and we're really focused in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then sulfur. So we looked at our kind of a, the nutrients that were in higher concentrations. Um, and cattails stored more nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and sulfur in shoots than any other species. That was from our first experiment. Their potential because of their growth is just higher than other plants. And they had the lowest concentrations of phosphorus, potassium, and sulfate in the remaining water. And the highest evaporation rate. So if you don't want to lose water, this is not the species for you. They, we were pushing 10 times evaporation rate alone. So we had tanks that were just water that were evaporating and the cattails were 10 times the water use. Most other species were two to three times. Now in the second experiment, that changed. We didn't get different nitrate concentrations other than cattail. Uh, phosphate concentrations remained, um, were higher in the control. We had an algae bloom issue. So we had some problems with phosphate. And so we had to redesign for the second run to try to address the algae bloom issue when you load this many nutrients. Um, and we did have potassium dropping below control. So we did effectively remove potassium. And so all fate was lowered in all species other than water sedge. So in our second experiment, and that's the pictures here, we looked at seven species and we were using water from an actual feedlot at Olds College. So um, it didn't have as high nitrogen as we'd liked, but it did have elevated phosphorus and potassium that we could work with. So we want to look at water use efficiency, uh, potential of each species to be used in floating islands, and then testing with the actual feedlot effluent. Uh, this is uh, a batch music cousin style uh, with tanks. Um, you can see in the corner here what the islands look like in the tanks. And so we got some good replication into this experiment. Um, and we use peat moss again. We wanted to go to something that's more real life, what we're gonna actually use in actual practice. And then we sample the soil to see what's in the soil medium, as well as the water flow. And three control tanks, five plants per tank. So we have uh, kind of a setup with some replication. And here's our species mix, Terex athroides. We use smartweed, common cattail, mare's tail, water sedge, Baltic brush, and small fruited bulrush. So looking at good growing species for wetland situations. We pulled the water from the feedlot in Wolves College. We grew the plants actually over the winter. Um, and we're planning to do a spring, um, like an April start and COVID hit and we delayed till July, but we were able to actually get this experiment started. And what we started to see, so this is initial uh, water dropped in, and this is after 
um, we had put it in. We had a drop in phosphorus right away, but you can see there were some drops right away in our system. And nitrate was below detection limit, which was a problem. We should have fertilized with nitrogen when we realized this. It affected some of the results, which you're going to see right here. Cattail tanked on us. It was our best performer, and it became biomass-wise our worst basic species almost. <clears throat> so in, in wet weight, well, other than smartweed, which was also very poor. And so smartweed in the greenhouse was not very effective. Even though it's big elsewhere. Um, Mare's tail has a wet weight that's huge, but a dry weight that's small. And you can see then uh, water sedge, weed sedge, and then Baltic rush being one of our biggest and small fruit of bulrush. So there's our biggest growing species by weight. When we looked into the effect here on tillering, so when what we saw was a growth rate of many of the plants kind of progressively grow other than cattail and smartweed. They just stayed basically the same the whole time. They were not happy. A small fruit of bulrush was a slow progression upward, but then we saw water sedge, wheat sedge, they had quite a nice growth curve, uh, mare's tail, and then Baltic rush were the best. And you can see they started the experiment at different rates just because of their ability to grow in these situations. For phosphorus, our control is right here. So the control tanks, you can see we were able to pull phosphorus down effectively. Least effective was our um, pond weed, our water smart weed. And most effective is kind of a mix, but um, Baltic rush is right in there um, with your small fruit of bull rush and wheat sedge. And then, yeah, their water sedge, cattail, mare's tail, all right in that mix. So you can use a mix of species and they all are quite effective. When we looked at the phosphorus in shoots, this is where you start seeing concentrations. Cattail had a lower concentration. Wheat said had the highest concentration in the shoots. Shoots are important because that's what you can harvest off. So you do want to see more in the shoots than the root system. Um, and then you have mare's tail, our pond, water smart weed, small fruit of bulrush, Baltic rush, and water sedge. And so these are significant. So if the letters are different, then it's a significant difference. If they have the same letters, then they're the same. So we have, you can see there are some overlaps here. Phosphorus in soil, um, you can see that the pond, the control is here. The pond, we, all of the phosphorus was ending up in the soil. It really wasn't going anywhere else. So we're seeing not much, the differences in the soil were there, but not huge amounts. When we looked at nitrogen, <clears throat> you can see here, uh, Baltic brush, it's the nitrogen fixer. That makes sense that it would have the highest nitrogen levels. It was able to supply its own nitrogen, which may explain why it performed so well in this condition. Um, water sedge and wheat sedge had higher, mare's tail had higher. So cattail and pond weed, you can see, are the ones. And I think this may have been what was limiting their growth. Nitrogen in soils versus the control. There's a number of them were lower in the control. Uh, potassium in water. And because our nitrogen was below detection limits in our uh, water, we couldn't have a figure like this for nitrogen on this experiment. Uh, potassium, you can see there was some reduction over the experiment in our controls, but we have a higher reduction in many of our species with cattail, uh, the pond weed, and small fruit of bulrush. And cattail being, um, was hungry for potassium, obviously. Cattail had a high concentration of potassium in its shoots. As I mentioned with the water, it looked like that was going to happen. Mare's tail actually did quite well as well, with, followed by small fruit of bulrush and water sedge. So different species, Baltic rush wasn't as effective here. So understanding your contaminant and your species is important. Not all species perform the same. <clears throat> we look at potassium in soils, you can see the control versus everything else. So significant reductions. Sulfate, we had something interesting happen in this experiment. So the previous experiment, we had reductions. This one, we were using tap water because the distilling water for this was ridiculous. The amount of water we had to distill 
um, became unmanageable. So we used tap water. The problem was our tap water had some salt, um, sulfur in it. And what ended up happening is we had a slow increase over time in our control with basically happened with everything. So that kind of confounded our results a little bit, but we can still see um, some differences where some species end up with much more. And this would be related to water use. The more water they use, the more we entered in, the more concentrated their sulfate was going to end up in. So the higher water use species ended up, and bolt brush being the one that performed the best growth wise, ended up being a water user, end up with higher sulfate. So this just shows if you make a mistake on your experimental setup, you do have to pay attention to what's going on. There was still some useful information. We found out mare's tail, the concentrations in the vegetation, the above ground growth was amazing. So mare's tail has real potential and small fruit of bulrush did quite well as well. Otherwise, everything else was basically the same. So that was um, kind of presentation on um, the nutrients. Now, what did water use look like? So I mentioned that we had a 10 times use of by cattail of evaporation alone. So here we have our evaporation alone tanks, the dotted line. And this is what happened with our species. Cattail punched up quite high and then started dropping as it, its growth got suppressed, where Baltic rush ended at the end being the high water user. So it started up higher and keeps on going. But you can see that there's a whole group of species that are high water users. So if you're trying to remove water from the system, there's specific species you should be using. The big sedges, Baltic rush, um, small fruit of bulrush, those are the type of species where the pond weed mare's tail were not that effective for that. So some takeaways there that were very useful. So what did we learn over these two experiments? High nutrient loading results um, in pre increased plant growth. And so something you may have to do is if you have big phosphorus problems, but no nitrogen, you may have to fertilize nitrogen into those plants in order to pull your phosphorus. If the plants are not growing actively and effectively, you end up not getting the removal of your target contaminants. So you do have to pay attention to those conditions. The other thing you need to know is if you have low nitrogen conditions, you may be able to effectively work with a nitrogen fixing plant and not have to deal with that. So that is something to be really thinking about. Um, cattail, water sedge, wheat sedge, um, plant heights and tillers were nearly double trial one versus trial two. So we saw some suppressive effects of that low nitrogen condition. And we did have to end our trial two because the plants decided it was November and they were going to sleep for the winter. And DIMAD, they're in the greenhouse, lights and everything. There is a point. We had the plants growing for a full year because we did the grow out first and then we started late. Um, and plants do need a dormant season. So if we'd put them outside for a month, brought them back in, we probably could have started up and gone again. But that is something to think about is you do have to give these plants breaks. And this is the effect of what end of November looks like in cattail. It started to, it was already suffering from nutrient deficiencies, but it started going dormant. Um, phosphorus was removed effectively by all plants. So we were getting 77 to 84% removal, higher than some of the previous studies at about 50%. So, and that's from a meta-analysis. So our variations, plant species is a big thing. Um, so taking into account plant species is something to think about. Phosphorus storage locations differ by species. Um, and that is something we noted in our selenium work is that the root versus shoot is different for a lot of species. So wheat sedge, water sedge, smart weed, and small fruit of bulrush kept great proportions in the shoots where it is easy to harvest. So sometimes the species might be the biggest storer of it, but it's all in the root system. That's not going to help you. Um, so shoot concentrations is what you're really after if you're trying to harvest it off. If you don't care about harvesting it off, then it doesn't matter. So uh, nitrate removal, um, previous studies of around 60% removal rates in floating islands. Um, our experiment had low in phase two. The first phase we were removing nitrogen, but we did have very poor in our fully replicated experiment in phase two. So we weren't able to show what we'd like to do. 
and we didn't, and we had incomplete nitrogen data, which is something we're going to fix for the next round where we didn't test all forms, which was definitely a deficiency in the design when the lab analysis was run. Um, and high oxygen levels may can reduce nitrogen removal, and that must be considered. So thinking about, we were oxygenating all these tanks, so they were all oxygenated every day. So we were growing a aerobic situation, not anaerobic. And that's something you will have to think about because if you're using microbial, some of these plants, sometimes going anaerobic is beneficial. Um, we showed between 70, 27 and 45 percent removal of potassium uh, by cattails, mare tail, small fruit bull rush, Baltic rush, water sedge, and wheat sedge. So those are the big performers there. Um, the plant material degrading at the end of the season can release potassium back to water. So this is something where you may have to harvest in the fall. So think about those type of considerations. Sulfate, we did have issues in our sulfate experiment. The tap water was one of our key issues. And we also have potential with peat with soil decomposition. So there were some issues there that because this wasn't um, done in inert material, we have some field level trial issues to deal with. So for next phase, um, we're going to be looking at <clears throat> assessing over winter um, in cold, cold climates. These islands are being tested um, with wintering effects. Uh, looking at our, all of our nitrogen properly, accounting for biomass and nutrient accumulation testing. There was some experimental errors in phase two, and we want to be able to see how many, how many square meters do you need to deal with so much water, and that's going to be one of the next phases. Um, and then we're going actually out onto feedlots, active feedlots. So that's the end of my presentation, and we can do some questions. First of all, thank you so much for the great presentation. It was really in depth. Um, we have lots of questions, so <laughs> I'm not sure if we'll get through them all, but we will try our best. Um, so the first one is regarding, um, there's actually multiple about this, um, contaminated biomass. How, how did you dispose of contaminated biomass after the experiments? Are there any effects noticed on wildlife feeding on the biomass, um, anything like that? So um, it all depends on your concentrations. So okay. a lot of times the concentrations we had in the plants were low enough that you're within safe levels. And like I say, selenium specifically is um, if your concentration is at the right level in the plant, which we were finding they're still fairly low levels, it basically can be um, fed to animals even. So it's almost a supplement. Instead of supplementing mineral selenium, you can do it this way. So. Um, we didn't have that high, and because we moved over in the selenium side to terrasatherase, which appears to be volatilizing it, it isn't as big of an issue. Other con contaminants and issues, if we get high hyperaccumulation, then we're looking at landfilling. So that's, okay. you're, you're looking at doing something to um, compost it down and then landfill that material. Okay. Um, the next question is from Beth. Did you leave the plants in the growth medium long enough for them to decompose? Um, have you had any studies on what happens with the parameters in the growing medium once the vegetation um, starts to de decompose back into the environment? And so that is an interesting question. Um, on our actual on-site work now, um, we are now in year six of this treatment of some of these ponds, and like, the selenium levels continue to drop on a yearly mm -hmm. basis. So we haven't, and these plants, we've had cycling plants decomposing over that period. So we're, we're seeing on the selenium side, something where it's either, uh, selenium has a function where it can precipitate out as well. So the form can change in this process and ends up immobilized in the pond, which is fine for the mine because they want clean water release. They don't care if they concentrate it. I'm working on a new experiment where we're looking actually on a distillation almost process where we're evaporating the water off, releasing clean water, and they're hoping that they would have concentrated selenium they can sell as a mineral. Um, so, and then they're using the plants as a screening to find it, polish um, some of the things that can't be captured. So there is some where we're looking at actually capturing that selenium more effectively, but precipitation out is one of the options um, in those mines because the regulation is what they release, not what they're keeping. Okay. 
That makes sense. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions about um, the floating islands. So how much yeah. maintenance is required after the initial installation of the floating islands? Uh, this is dependent on the islands you use. So the ones that we're building, um, just as a perspective on toughness, I backed up a truck by mistake and hit an island and created a, like a little tiny dent on the corner and the wheel went up right on top of it. So oh. they're, they're metal cased, so foam core metal case with a plastic um, like box liner like, um, we patented this process and it's a plastic kind of sprayed on um, exterior. And so ice, like we can have them, we had our nesting islands freeze into ice, the ice dropped to the bottom of the water and they just shot back up when they melted out of the ice. So wow. they're pretty durable. We made it very specific that there's closed foam um, core so that there's no way air can get, or water can log into them and take mm -hmm. their weight down. So they should have really no maintenance. Um, they should be like 20, 30, 40 years just sitting there without any maintenance. The maintenance comes in for what contaminants we're removing. So nutrient loading, you may have to harvest off that material. And if it's just nutrients, you can compost that in and be great for compost. But for metals and some of those, you might have to landfill that. That makes sense. Sounds like they're tested for life in Canada. <laughs> well, that, well, that's because we dealt with some of the other ones. And like I said, um, there was one set that they've been irrigated for three years and the plants are still not growing because they're not getting enough water. So if you're mm. sitting on a water body and you can't get enough water to the plants, and we've had a few of them that fall apart, um, yeah. nesting by birds is the biggest issue. Um, that's why we have little fences on ours. So ours are built to take those little fences on them. Uh, some of them are not built there. If they're a foam mat, how do you put a wire mesh on there to keep birds out? So that can be a maintenance issue as the birds. Mm, um, so okay. those type of considerations definitely need to be made. Okay, that is good to know. And uh, Wilf is wondering about what depth of water are floating islands effective? So our, when I'm working on the mine, that was our, my best example, I, I sample the roots and when I'm pulling out the roots, the roots are going down about a meter of the bottom of the island. So I know that they're actively touching that top kind of meter of water column but beneath that, they may not be touching it. Um, and that's where we, if you're keeping those layers and you're pushing the anaerobic, that's part of our benefit on selenium is we want the system to go anaerobic because then the microbial system is active as well. Um, when I pulled out the roots, they were just covered in nodules. So there's a microbial element here that hasn't been fully studied yet that is part of this process. But yeah, I know the surface meter, but beneath that, it might be untreated water. And so that mm -hmm. is something to take into account in your process of how deep you want those ponds to be. Okay. Or where you extract your clean water. Thank you. Uh, Kevin is wondering if, do you have any caging underneath to prevent muskrats from eating the roots? So my islands are uh, mesh grating on the bottom that's PCB coated and a mesh grating on the top that's PCB coated for anything where muskrats are. So basically there's no way, and that's a one inch hole, there's no way for them to get in on either side. So they can harvest off roots, they can harvest off some shoots, but they can't get into it. Um, okay. But yeah, that is a very important thing. I, that is a huge deficiency on a lot of the islands I've run into, why we couldn't use them, is mm -hmm. must rats dig through them. That makes sense. Well, I'm glad you found a solution. Yeah. Um, Zora's wondering if you consider using microbial inoculants to increase the absorption of contaminant. That is definitely on the books for something we need to keep considering. That um, selenium trial we did in the greenhouse, we actually took mud from on the mine site that was in the, the settling ponds into and spiked it small amounts into our each of those tanks with the hope of actually getting microbial activity going. So microbial activity is a huge component to this and is something that I haven't done the research on, but it's definitely something that needs to be added. Um, Shirley has a question. Um, she said, regarding your greenhouse trial, you noted that your rushes seem to take up selenium, um, but just wants to clarify what you said. Did you say that you did not detect selenium in the plant's tissues? Um, we did. On all of them in the greenhouse, we detected them in the tissues. Um, 
it's just um, we didn't replicate that. So I can't see an actual confirmed number on that trial. So okay. we went and analyzed it. We did have uptake, but that wasn't a replicated experiment. And I can't share the mine experiment that actually had the replication, unfortunately. Okay. No problem. We understand. Um, Shirley's also wondering about, um, she says, matching plant species to site contaminants seems to be an important step. Does each project require a test of species performance before application of floating mats? So um, <clears throat> for novel new contaminants, yes. The goal is with what we're doing at Olds College, these are public documents that mm -hmm. slowly we're going to build up a database of information. And mm -hmm that'll tell us more about. So for nutrients, I already know some of the best performers. So we have a good step forward. So, um, but as we get into other mine um, type situations, other contaminants, definitely like sulfalene, we had to restart from scratch on that one. Thanks. Um, we're out of time for today. Um, there's still a couple questions in the question and answer section. If you don't mind just um, typing in an answer, that would be great. And uh, we're going to give everyone a five minute bio break before our next presenter. So um, we'll resume here at 1130. Um, but thank you so much, Stephen, for the awesome presentation. Yeah. There's a ton of people writing in. Thank you. And that it was very interesting. And um, thank you for the native, prairie, uh, the native plant research. So I just want to yeah. reiterate um, all of those comments there. And, Thank you for the excellent presentation. No, oh, thank you very much. Okay, and to everyone who's listening out there, uh, four minutes left, take a quick break and we'll resume at 11.30. Um, our next present... Our next presentation is Carrie Finlay, and I'm delighted to be able to invite Jessica Terrio, who will be introducing our final session presenter on behalf of our platinum sponsor, The Mosaic Company. So I'll pass it over to Jessica. Excellent. Thanks, Caitlin. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, great to be here as well this morning and for Mosaic to have the opportunity to sponsor this event again this year. For those of you that I haven't met, as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Jessica Terrio. I actually am Director of Government and Public Affairs for Mosaic and based with the Regina office here in Saskatchewan. But um, at the heart of my soul is environment and environmental engineering, and that's the, my educational background. So grateful to be here for so many reasons here this morning and also help to lead the ESG program across all of our North American business sites at Mosaic. So just a quick blurb about Mosaic. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, Mosaic is the world's largest integrated producer of phosphates and potash. And we have over just 13,000 employees around the world um, with actually operating in nine countries. And here in Saskatchewan, we have three mines. We've got our solution mine in Belle Plaine, and then we've got the two conventional mines, one in Colonsay and one in Esterhazy. Um, when we talk about sustainability or ESG, that's definitely not something that's new to Mosaic. We've been reporting and working on ESG initiatives back all the way back to 2009. And um, in 2020, we announced 13 new ESG targets that align with five of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And then more recently, just before Christmas, we announced our new net zero targets. And when we talk about ESG at Mosaic, really that's all about our ESG leads and our ESG teams and looking at innovation and research and best practices and, and learning from others. And when I look at the conference here today and the agenda, that's really what this is all about. It's about learning and sharing in a collective effort to really make sure that we have a more sustainable future. And so with that, I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Carrie before I turn it over to her. So for those of you that haven't met um, Dr. Finley, uh, Dr. Carrie Finley completed her undergraduate degree from the University of Toronto and a PhD from the University of Guelph. And she also completed a postdoc fellowship at the University of Quebec in Montreal before coming to the University of Regina actually way back now in 2006. Um, Carrie's interests include both water quality and greenhouse gases in prairie water bodies, including lakes and small wetland and agricultural ponds. And her work has also expanded to include investigations of control and potential management options for improved water quality and irrigation and livestock use on farmland. And this work is definitely relevant to today, to our current climate environment, 
as we need to improve both our potential mitigation and our adaptation options to all assist with climate change. So with that, I am going to turn it right over to Carrie to learn more on this. Great. Thanks so much, Jessica, for that introduction and Carolyn and uh, Caitlin for the invitation uh, to talk today. Uh, yeah, so uh, as Jessica said, my, my general research interests, I definitely am interested in both adaptation and mitigation um, to climate change. Uh, but what I'm going to focus on today is really looking at uh, potential carbon sinks and whether the water bodies, the small water bodies on agricultural land in particular could potentially be used as carbon sinks. So I know this is a wetland workshop, um, and so I am definitely going to um, spend a fair bit of time talking about wetlands, but uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing has been on dugouts. Um, so I use a few terms interchangeably throughout the talk, constructed agricultural ponds, reservoirs, um, and I'll, I'll be sure to highlight that, but I am referring to dugouts. It's just outside of Saskatchewan, outside of the prairies. Um, this doesn't always translate super well to people. So I'm assuming everybody here is, is familiar with dugouts, um, but uh, I, I do use a few words interchangeably here. So yeah, I'm at the University of Regina. I've been here since 2006, which yeah, it's been a while. Uh, so the work I'm presenting today is primarily the work of my uh, master's student who defended in the fall, Sydney Jensen. Um, but also there's some work towards the end that Ryan Remus, who is a PhD student in my lab, uh, has been working on recently. Uh, Jackie, D Jackie Webb was a postdoc with me uh, several years ago and she is now in Australia. She went home to Australia and is doing similar work there. So there's some cool uh, comparisons between um, you know, arid climates in, in uh, Saskatchewan and Australia that uh, we're working on. And then also in collaboration with Peter Levitt and Gavin Simpson um, at the U of R and Helen Balch from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, and so I just want, like to start with my acknowledgements. Um, all of this work required um, a lot of help from a lot of different people. So we've got some lab support at the Institute for Environmental Change and Society with Bjorn Whistle and Zoraida Quinones Rivera. Um, and then our field and lab team. So over the years, I uh, had a team of undergraduate students that have helped out with all of the field sampling, driving around the province, um, lifting heavy canoes, <laughs> and doing literally the heavy lifting for this. Um, and the funding for this has come from a variety of sources, including the Ministry of Agriculture um, in the government of Saskatchewan, uh, the Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, as well as NSERC in the University of Regina. So uh, yeah, a lot of different people have contributed to the work that I'm gonna be showing you today. So I am gonna be presenting a fair bit of data uh, today and hopefully I have uh, some conclusions uh, that I can, uh, can be of uh, interest to uh, the audience here today. Um, so part of the impetus for working on um, greenhouse gases in small water bodies, you might ask, you know, if you think about where our carbon sources and sinks are, especially in the prairies, you're not going to say water is your first, um, <laughs> your first guess is not going to be the water because we just don't have that much of it. Um, however, so we've been working, I've been working on larger systems, lakes in the Capel for many years um, and other natural systems like that. But more work globally has been um, finding that small water bodies are behaving or contributing disproportionately uh, to the global carbon budget. So we're starting to really appreciate how numerous um, I think previously the ability to count water bodies, um, you know, relied on uh, you know, satellite imagery and so forth. And so you needed really big water bodies to be able to count them. But we're starting to appreciate how many of these small lakes and ponds actually do exist. Um, and there's a lot of work suggesting that they are processing carbon much more quickly uh, than our large lakes. So these figures here um, on the right are looking at carbon dioxide and methane in particular versus the area of the water body uh, that has been studied. And there's a lot of scatter in here, but we do get significant relationships showing that the smaller water bodies have higher concentrations of CO2, higher concentrations of methane than do the larger water bodies. So there's a lot of work suggesting that these smaller water bodies um, are contributing disproportionately. I think they're really much more important in the landscape and in the global carbon budget than had been previously appreciated. And this is starting to, to gain traction. I think we're starting to appreciate this, but it's raising a lot more questions about some of the details about this. Uh, as well, so quite a lot of the work about aquatic carbon um, sinks and, and sources 
has really focused um, in the boreal system. People that work on water, uh, like me, uh, obviously like to be in water. And so we tend to work in the boreal system. We tend to work in areas that have a lot of lakes. Um, but I think these agricultural areas, the drier semi-arid er semi -arid areas like the prairies um, are really understudied in, in comparison. Um, so, Agricultural ponds, and I don't need to explain this to this audience, but a lot of different um, uses of these uh, on agricultural land for flood and drought mitigation, water source for irrigation and livestock. Um, but again, very minimal work has been done on them in terms of their role in the global carbon budget. So some work in Australia uh, has shown that the spatial extent of these uh, had really been underestimated. So there's a lot more of these farm ponds um, that exist across the landscape. And so this is uh, just this pie chart at the bottom is showing that relative to reservoirs across the landscape, um, uh, the farm ponds are taking up nearly half of the, the total uh, water surface, um, but that they are also disproportionately contributing to um, carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, so 70%, 76% of the CO2 emissions uh, from water bodies were coming from these farm ponds. So there's an appreciation that these small ponds um, in the agricultural setting might be strong greenhouse gas sources. Um, my title suggested I'm talking about sinks. So why am I doing that? <laughs> um, first, I'll give you a bit of a backgrounder of exactly what we're looking at here, but there is some reason to suggest that the water bodies in Southern Saskatchewan are actually carbon sinks. So what we've been focusing on the last several years is really looking at greenhouse gas fluxes um, in these small ponds. So we are looking at all three major greenhouse gases of nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and methane. Okay, so all of these gases can exist in a dissolved form in water. If we have higher concentrations of these gases in the water than what we have in the atmosphere, then we're going to lose the gas to the atmosphere. So it's going to outgas, it's going to emit uh, the gas to the atmosphere. In contrast, if the concentration is lower in the water than it is in the atmosphere, then they can actually pull it in. So carbon dioxide is a, um, a good example um, or something that you can intuitively understand where if you have like a lot of algae in your pond, um, these are plants, they are photosynthesizing um, and so they can suck up CO2. So if we can get carbon dioxide um, sucked up into plant or algal biomass, um, then that dies, it decomposes, we can bury it in the sediments and that can be a carbon sink. So we've been doing a lot of work on CO2, um, but recognizing that if we want full greenhouse gas budgets, we need to consider methane and nitrous oxide as well. So um, this diagram, I don't need to go into a lot of the details, but just looking at um, where the gases are being produced um, and how this can potentially impact the gas flux across the water air interface here. So I'm gonna be talking a fair bit about CO2 equivalent flux. So we add up the nitrous oxide, the carbon dioxide and the methane fluxes um, and put them into a common um, a global warming potential. So methane is a stronger um, global warming, um, has a, a stronger global warming potential than does CO2. So we just multiply that by a, a factor and nitrous oxide is much, much higher as well. So we multiply that by a number add it to CO2, multiply methane by a number and make it CO2 equivalent flux. Okay, so uh, we've been very interested in looking at these flux rates, calculating CO2 equivalent flux. Um, but the other thing that we really need to consider is that even if our CO2 equivalent flux, even if the net result is an emission of CO2 or greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, these ponds could still be a sink if this burial number is high enough. So if our carbon burial exceeds the CO2 equivalent flux, we could still have carbon sinks. Okay, and I'm gonna give you a bit of a spoiler that um, I'm gonna keep emphasizing how important burial is, but we don't have good numbers of carbon burial. So this is uh, something that is on our to-do list. I, we're working on it. Um, I do have some numbers for you towards the end of this presentation about carbon burial, um, but there's a lot of caveats surrounding those numbers. Okay, so, in 2017 through 2019, um, we undertook a large uh, spatial analysis, and this was looking at dugouts specifically. So we found 100 sites across southern Saskatchewan and uh, measured them for greenhouse gases. So the results that I'm going to show here are just from 2017, but we saw similar things in 2018 and 2019. So the cool thing, so these are all dugouts, and we've got carbon dioxide, we've got methane, and nitrous oxide. 
Um, and these are flux rates, okay? So not concentration, but how much is moving in and out of the water body. Um, each bar here represents a dugout, um, one through 100, and they're just ranked from low to high uh, for each of the gas fluxes, okay? So the really interesting results that we found was that 50% of the dugouts were carbon dioxide sinks. So anything below zero uh, means that they were undersaturated and they were sucking CO2 in from the atmosphere. So we had half of them that were pulling in CO2 and we had half of them that were emitting CO2. Obviously the ones that were emitting CO2, how much they were emitting was a lot larger than the ones uh, that were actually sucking in CO2. Uh, for methane, all of them were sources. Okay, a uh, huge range in how much methane was being produced, some of them not very much, some of them quite a lot. And then the really surprising result here was that 73% of our dugouts were nitrous oxide sinks. We expected, given the high levels of nitrogen fertilization on the landscape, that we would have a lot of nitrogen in the system and we would produce quite a bit of nitrous oxide. Um, but instead, we actually found the bulk of them were um, undersaturated and actually pulling uh, nitrous oxide in from the atmosphere. Again, with some extreme uh, <laughs> exceptions here. Um, but, uh, but this was pretty encouraging for the nitrous oxide component of it. And as a side note, again, we can talk about details of how and why, but ultimately we believe this is uh, complete denitrification. So uh, the inorganic nitrogen in the water is being completely converted to the inert N2 gas. Um, yeah. So we were able to look at the ranges of gas fluxes uh, across these 100 dugouts, and then we were also able to get into the mechanisms behind them. And again, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but I just wanted to emphasize that we looked at, you know, what is controlling these rates? We see huge ranges in the rates of fluxes um, among different dugouts. And so we, we did some uh, fancy stats on this and looked at the controls of the carbon dioxide, the methane and the nitrous oxide. And I've got a few figures that look like this uh, coming up. Uh, generally, anything in green font means that this was a significant um, predictor of CO2. So uh, in this case, the so CO2 was significantly correlated with productivity to respiration ratios um, and inorganic carbon. Okay. Um, but organic carbon here was not significant. So anything in black was not significant. Anything in green was significant. The signs negative and positive uh, just refers to the, um, the direction of the relationship. So a negative relationship between um, productivity to respiration for CO2. And again, you know, we've got this published. If you want the details of why, we can get into it. But my point of this slide is just to um, emphasize that we have a pretty good understanding of what is controlling uh, the biological, the hydromorphological, the landscape level factors that are controlling the gases, gas concentrations, and gas fluxes in dugouts. Okay. So the question then becomes, and I think for the, this audience in particular, you're going to be asking this as well, that's all fine and dandy for dugouts, but what about wetlands? What about the wetland ponds? Okay, so how does greenhouse gas production and the controls um, compare between the dugouts and wetland ponds? So we have a few reasons um, to expect these to be different. So there are a lot of similarities, right? These are, you know, if you go to agricultural land, you can have a dugout right here and you can have a wetland over here. They should have the same water source. Um, it's on the same landscape, um, same soil characteristics, same microclimate, um, all that type of thing that you would expect could create some similar um, results in terms of gases and gas flux. But the differences that we think might be important um, have to do a lot with the uh, size, shape, and age of dugouts versus wetlands. So the biggest difference, um, if we just drew this out schematically really is that the wetland ponds are shallower. Um, so I'll go through the methods shortly and where we studied this, um, but uh, we did a direct comparison between dugouts and wetlands. One of the biggest differences was the difference in max depth. So um, the dugouts unsurprisingly, because they are built and dug to be reasonably deep, um, they were quite a bit deeper than were the wetland ponds. Um, this resulted in um, a shallower um, water clarity. Uh, so the Secchi disc is, is how clear the water is. Um, and so the dugouts were actually clearer. Uh, you could see through the water column uh, more than the wetland ponds. We also saw differences in uh, the amount of nitrogen. So more nitrogen in the wetland ponds and more organic carbon in the wetland ponds. So we know that all of these factors are important for our gases, our gas production and gas fluxes. 
um, but we weren't sure what the implications would be in terms of absolute um, numbers of this. Okay, so the objectives then of that study um, were to evaluate and compare the carbon dioxide, the nitrous oxide, and methane concentrations in agricultural reservoirs, so in the dugouts, and compare them to the wetland ponds. So how much is actually in dugouts versus wetlands? Um, and then can we get into those mechanisms behind them? Um, so do they have the same drivers uh, behind them that are regulating the, the fluxes? So uh, how we did this, so again, this is the work by Sydney Jensen. Um, in 2018, she went out and um, studied 20 pairs of dugouts and wetlands. So she was looking for sites um, that were within a couple hundred meters of each other on the same land use um, without like roads or anything major in between them so that they would be fairly similar in terms of those soil characteristics and so forth. So she measured uh, a variety of different components, nitrogen, phosphorus, inorganic, inorganic carbon, uh, chlorophyll A as a measurement of algal growth, um, oxygen at both the surface and the deep, some chemical variabilities, uh, variables, um, so conductivity, um, salinity are related, uh, the alkalinity, the pH, um, as well as uh, the mixing. So is there an anoxic layer at the bottom um, or are they fully mixed all the time? Um, and we're getting a lot of this um, mixing up of stuff from the sediments. Um, put this all into um, statistics. So a model is a generalized additive model, allows us to put all of these potential controls in and see what comes out as significant predictors. So you can see the dots here representing the pairs um, where they were a uh, fairly good distribution across the southern third of the province or so. Okay, so this diagram here, now I'm looking at the flux rates, the comparisons between the dugouts on the left and the wetlands on the right. We've got carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, and then our uh, when we add it all up into the CO2 equivalent flux. So lots of really interesting results that came out of this. So in terms of CO2, we really see on average no significant difference. Okay, um, The amount of CO2 leaving the wetlands and the dugouts, pretty much the same. Uh, nitrous oxide was interesting. The wetlands were, most of them were sinks again, like we had seen for the dugouts previously, but the wetlands were actually even bigger sinks, which is, um, you know, good <laughs> if we're looking at greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, so yes, yeah, pretty big sinks of nitrous oxide. In terms of the methane, um, methane is always a bit of a problem or a, a challenge because we have to worry both about diffusion. So Diffusion is just, um, you have dissolved methane in the water and that will outgas as I described before. Um, but methane can also be produced in bubbles. Um, so it gets created in the sediments and it creates uh, gas bubbles. And these very quickly can provide big pulses of uh, methane release to the atmosphere. So we measured both of those um, and uh, have both of them um, included in the diagram here. So the diffusive flux of methane was similar between the dugouts and the wetlands, but we had much higher um, bubble rate uh, emission in the wetlands. I will caution, I'm going to point this out now, we have, it's essentially three points that are really dragging this up in terms of the bubbles in the wetlands. We have no reason to remove them. Um, and so there is potentially a lot of bubble produced in, in wetlands. But when we put this into the CO2 equivalent flux, then it means that our wetlands, you can see this blue bar, this is the bubbles of, of methane is really dominating um, and really skewing um, the average um, CO2 equivalent flux from the wetlands. So although wetland CO2 flux to the atmosphere is definitely higher than the reservoirs, again, this is getting really, I don't want to overemphasize it. I think it's real, but it, it might be really um, strongly tied to these bubbling events in a few sites. Okay. Um, if we divide this up and look at them a little bit uh, differently. So again, I'm now looking at each of these bars representing a different site. Um, so each bar represents a different dugout or a wetland pond here. Um, and we look at the total CO2 equivalent flux. Um, we see that dugouts, we had about two of them that were net sinks overall, um, and the rest of them were net sources of CO2. Um, and despite that previous figure, what's interesting here is that we had like six or seven out of the 20 wetland ponds that were net sinks uh, and fewer that were sources. Um, but the key here is that if you look at the y-axis, um, these rates are much, much higher uh, than what we see in the dugouts. So wetlands were more likely to be CO2 equivalent sinks, but those that were sources could be bigger sources. So a bigger range that we see in the wetland ponds than what we see in the dugouts. 
When we look at the underlying mechanisms behind them, so the drivers behind these different um, uh, gases and gas fluxes, um, again, I won't get into a lot of the details here, um, but the green represents significant um, factors that came into the model and the uh, plus minus represents the direction of the relationship. So what's pretty, <laughs> it was quite frustrating trying to write the, the paper, um, but it's interesting that our flux rates are comparable more or less between the dugouts and the wetlands, but the underlying drivers were different, um, which yeah, created some issues. So you can see, you know, the dugouts, um, those factors that were insignificant uh, for the dugouts were significant for the, the wetlands and vice versa. We did see pond mixing um, being quite important in both cases. So whether or not we see this stirring up or the mixing uh, of the pond and the stuff from the bottom, uh, making it up to the surface seems to be really important for uh, CO2 flux here. In terms of methane, again, similar, we had some similar controls. Um, we had a few additional things that were significant with the uh, dugouts uh, compared to the wetlands. Um, but the big one that we have found in a lot of different studies to this point is that conductivity is a really important driver of methane. Um, so conductivity correlated with salinity. And I think the key here for understanding the mechanism is that it is related to sulfate. So when we have high sulfate, we see a suppression of methane, okay? Um, and this just has to do with the microbes that are producing methane um, versus they get outcompeted by these sulfur reducing bacteria. So if you have a lot of sulfate, it means a different microbe can take over and it, um, it outcompetes the, the bacteria that are producing methane. So higher conductivity, higher sulfate reduces uh, methane production. And we've seen this time and again, but it, it's good to see it again showing up in the wetland ponds. Um, so for the nitrous oxide, um, here we're seeing uh, <laughs> what was interesting here as well, again, difficult to explain in detail, but uh, we did have the same uh, factors that were significant, but in opposite directions. Um, so yeah, we do have explanations for this. Um, there are reasons why we, uh, why we see this, um, but ultimately um, we do understand the, the general um, drivers behind these, these gas fluxes. So I think that's, um, you know, in terms of the gas fluxes, um, we do have, I think we do have a quite a good understanding of what's driving it, um, what the magnitude of these fluxes are. Um, and I think we're doing okay that way. There's still a lot of like, you know, little things that need to be teased apart. Um, but I, I think our understanding is quite good on the flux um, at the air water interface. But what about carbon burial? So I said right at the beginning that the key here is really how much we're actually sequestering in the sediments. So if these are going to be actual carbon sinks, it's one thing to have net flux that is just a net pulling in gas from the atmosphere, but we have to get it into the sediments. Okay, um, once we're in the sediments, especially in a dugout or you know a lake, if you wanted to compare it to that, once you get carbon in the sediments, it's a pretty long-term store. Like it's gonna stay there as long as there's water um, in the water body, um, which I know <laughs> can be a, a discussion later because these things do dry out. Um, but once you get it down there, um, it really doesn't go anywhere. You'll have some um, um, uh, remineralization or mineralization. Um, you know, there, some things will be breaking down uh, organic carbon, but once it's down there, it stays for, for quite a long time, like hundreds of years. So we really wanna know uh, what this burial rate is and how it compares to our gas fluxes. I'll note that I do also have this, you know, some of the carbon that's going to be in the system can be coming from outside of the system. Um, and uh, if that settles and accumulates, then we can be in that carbon sink. So the issue here is that um, it's surprisingly difficult to, to measure. Um, I mean, gas fluxes sound more complicated, but uh, the techniques are pretty well established. When we're measuring carbon accumulation in the sediments, because this occurs over many years um, and it takes quite a while for it to really start to accumulate, we have to use very different methods. Um, part of the problem, so one option is to use a sediment core. So we just take a tube and we shove it into the uh, sediments and we pull out, we measure how much carbon is in the sediments, and then we can do some dating on it. If we know how old it is um, at different depths, then we can calculate how much carbon has accumulated per year. The problem with dugouts is that they're not old enough to use our standard techniques. Um, lead to 10 dating 
needs us to go back, you know, 60, at least years, 70 years. Um, and a lot of our dugouts aren't that old. Um, we've had problems aging our dugouts as well um, in just talking to the landowners and getting accurate ages. So dugout sediment cores have been problematic. Um, we haven't tried it on the wetlands yet, but I think this is something that we need to do. We should be able to do that there. We've also been working with sediment traps. Um, and so these are just PVC tubes that are suspended. So they're anchored into the sediments, suspended in the water column and then attached to a float. Um, and so it just accumulates anything that is dead and sinking down is going to get trapped in a sediment trap. We collect it once a month, we analyze it for how much carbon is in there. Um, so the sediment traps, uh, again, Ryan Remus now is working on this. Um, we did some sediment trap work last year and he's gonna continue it that um, next year. Um, there are some additional assumptions um, about the fate of that carbon as well that need to be considered. Uh, the problem with sediment traps in wetlands is that the wetlands are only half a meter deep. Um, and these things, you know, the PVC tubes are, I think we had them at half a meter, but we're gonna shrink them down a little bit. So it, it really, it, you don't have a lot of water column to collect from. And so it is a bit of a challenge. So we have been struggling with this. We know it's really important. We are working on it and I'm hoping to get some better uh, numbers on sedimentation because I think this is key in terms of figuring out how big um, a sink they actually are. That said, we have some estimates. Um, and again, this is uh, all taken with a large grain of salt. Um, so the dugouts that we have measured carbon burial on uh, to date. Uh, so we do have uh, estimates here. The error bar is just showing this is the extreme, the highest value of, of um, carbon sedimentation rates. And then comparing to published rates uh, across the globe. Okay, so dugouts are reasonably high relative to others in terms of how much carbon we think they are um, settling. And then if we compare it to other studies that have looked at wetlands, so inland wetlands, wetlands and peatlands, um, uh, the wetlands seem to be much smaller. Again, I'm hesitant to take these numbers. I did it anyway. <laughs> take these numbers from other studies um, in order to calculate our total carbon budget um, for the wetlands versus the dugouts. Um, we need these numbers locally. Okay, so that's just my, my big, big caution here. So my back of the envelope calculations, almost literally um, with just a, a scrap piece of paper, um, but it looks like based on that CO2 equivalent flux and our estimates based on that previous slide of how much carbon is accumulating in the sediments, um, it looks like dugouts are burying about 70 times as much carbon than they're emitting um, by gaseous flux. So I think the dugouts could potentially be pretty big sinks. The wetland ponds are burying about 2.6 times the carbon that they are emitting via uh, gaseous flux. Again, I, <laughs> I'm very cautious. I'm putting this number down because uh, I historically will just sit on the fence and, and just say, oh, we need to do more work. We do need to do more work. Um, but I, I just wanted to start presenting some actual numbers about this. So 2.6 times as much carbon. So they are carbon sinks. Um, this is based on sedimentation rates in other sites, okay? So I would love to measure it here. I think it's probably going to be higher here. Um, and I think this number is gonna be quite a bit bigger. This is also because the wetland ponds, again, we had that big bubble uh, flux of methane um, that is also going to make the um, efflux or the loss of carbon to the atmosphere um, much, much higher in the wetlands. So again, refining those bubbles is, is going to refine this number a little bit more. So if we look at the average size of our dugouts and our wetlands and multiply this difference, so the net um, sinking relative to how much is being lost, then we're looking at dugouts burying um, net 950 kilograms, so almost a ton of carbon per year. So an entire site over the entire surface area of a dugout. And the wetland ponds are, um, sorry, um, burying a net 57 kilograms of carbon per year. So pretty big difference based on these numbers, but again, very, very cautious estimates at this point. And I think this is driving me to really start to refine these numbers a little bit more. It's, um, it's a lot of incentive to do that, okay? So a lot of assumptions in these calculations, uh, please take it with a grain of salt, um, but it, it is a start and this is what we're working on um, going forward. So just wrapping up then, uh, greenhouse gas production, we're saying the Gases are comparable between reservoirs and wetland ponds. Uh, so the dugouts and wetlands are quite similar, um, but the controls behind them were pretty uh, different. 
Okay, so typically carbon dioxide um, was more driven by primary productivity photosynthesis, um, and it seemed to be respiration in the wetlands. Um, methane, generally, we seem to see it higher in more productive systems. Um, uh, and we do see that relationship with high sulfate concentrations. So it's lower when we have more sulfate. Um, nitrous oxide, we have this complete denitrification occurring in both water body types, um, but our underlying drivers are a bit different or in different directions. Um, oops. If we really look at what the major differences are behind them, we really think it's the age, the shape and the depth um, that is driving these differences between them. Um, so this is causing different patterns of mixing. Like I said, the wetlands are shallower, they're gonna be mixed more often. Um, they're older, they've had more time to accumulate organic carbon that can be used um, for CO2 and methane production. So I think what this means is we step back and want to scale these things up. Um, I think we could take these numbers and just you know, we could get estimates across the province or across the prairies um, if we just wanted an estimate of how much gas was, was um, moving in or out. You could kind of sum dugouts and wetlands together. But if you want a mechanistic understanding or, um, you know, be able to do predictions based on, you know, climate change or land use changes or that type of thing, we're going to have to separate them. Um, we need to consider dugouts and uh, wetland ponds separately. Um, but overall, our small water bodies, I, I, we can conclude that they are a net carbon sinks, um, but the range is really quite big right now. So going forward, uh, really working to refine uh, those numbers, um, starting to hone in on that more. So that's all I had prepared to talk about today and uh, happy to take questions. First of all, thank you so much. Um, one of our listeners wrote in and says, thank you. It's great to know the difference between natural wetlands and dugouts, and they both have a role in carbon sequestration. And um, we've had quite a few people type in that uh, it's excellent information, and I just want to reiterate that. So thank great, you, thanks. Carrie. Um, we do have a few questions already. So the first one um, from an anonymous attendee says, how were dugouts in the study chosen? Were they located on different land use types? Um, I mean, the hundred that I talked about at the beginning were really chosen. We wanted to get a really nice spatial distribution. We wanted, we thought there would be more geographical differences, you know, climate, um, you know, hydrology, but like this precipitation in particular. Um, and so our goal, how we did it was we just wanted to get across the southern third of the province and just put out a call. And a lot of it was who wanted us there, <laughs> who was willing to have us come out. Um, ease of accessibility, honestly, we didn't want to drive through the middle of fields um, in order to do so. So things that we could get to reasonably easily. Um, and yeah, so we do, in terms of land use, uh, we, we did record all of that. There are definitely some differences. So a lot, uh, so pasture land versus cropland and whether the cattle had direct access or not. Um, and so those are important factors. We do have that information uh, available, but we didn't enter, uh, didn't put that into the models. It didn't seem to have a huge effect um, on our rates, um, but I do think there's some important implications of that, uh, particularly with water quality, but that's a whole other story. Thanks for that answer. Um, May is wondering, with your detailed studies of processes, are you able to give recommended beneficial practices for managing or constructing um, egg ponds? That's a great question. Um, so we have found, I think, typically when we're looking at gases, well, gases and water quality, the deeper the better. Um, so a nice deep dugout um, without a lot of, you know, sloping sides, um, I, I will caution this in a second, <laughs> but, but yeah, just a, a nice steep, you know, as, as dugouts are, are drawn, um, it's, it's probably the best for, um, for both the gases and the water quality. I will say um, this is a wetland group and I don't want to imply that dugouts are better than wetlands because I don't believe that there's so many additional benefits to the wetlands that I think need to be discussed and considered. Um, it's just straight on the math that we have done. Um, if you want lower greenhouse gases, then a, a deep dugout is going to be better. Um, we are working on uh, doing some dredging of some sites and looking at that before and after. So the impact of, of dredging them, of cleaning them out, and then um, seeing the impact of that on the gases and, and the water quality, I think is going to be pretty interesting. Um, I think that's the major one right now. Cool, thank you. Uh, Krista says, do you have an idea of what happens to the buried carbon after a dugout is cleaned out? Yeah. There was a lot of dugout cleaning activity this year once dugouts dried out in the drought. Um, does this create a big release of carbon? 
yeah, so that's a, a, a nice segue from the last answer as well in terms of dredging. Um, so this is a, another aspect of Ryan Remus's PhD uh, program is what happens when things dry out. So both when they dry out, but also, yeah, that carbon that you're pulling out and put on the sides. Um, that's a difficult question and it's something totally on our radar. It's going to take quite a while. So, you know, the, the process of just digging it out and then putting it in mounds on either side of it. I mean, the mounds last a pretty long time. And I think, you know, if they're sort of contained, it's going to still stay sort of as like a soil like uh, carbon uh, store. Um, but we are going to lose some, absolutely. So that carbon sink is going to be lower when you dredge it and pull that out. Uh, absolutely. So yeah, looking at the whole life cycle of this is is a challenge for sure. For sure, yeah, for sure. And Heather's wondering, uh, for dugouts that were high sources of GHG gases in the 100 sampled, were they high for all three gases mm. or would there be ways to target those dugouts to improve their sink capacity? Yeah, these are good questions. Um, I think it's, uh, we do have the breakdown of that. Um, it's usually methane, like I think, especially when you're doing CO2 equivalent flux, because methane is much more potent than CO2, um, it tends to have a disproportionate effect. So, and this is where um, there are interesting trade-offs and I think some really interesting conversations to be had because mm -hmm. um, obviously, I mean, I'm not gonna propose that you throw salt in your dugout <laughs> in order to reduce methane, um, but I think it's, the higher the sulfate, the lower your methane, I think that's gonna pull it down. Um, so obviously there's a toss up, you don't want high sulfate, it's a huge problem for cattle. Um, and this is other work that we're doing right now is really looking at controls of sulfate. So I think the, the approach is more, if you have a high sulfate dugout, maybe this is something that, you know, keep the cattle out, it's just not used for, um, for livestock, um, but maybe we can use it as carbon offsets or you know something along those lines. So different uses uh, based on the chemistry underlying it, but I think it's, it's primarily methane. Okay, that makes sense. Um, speaking of cattle, Zoe's wondering if cattle were accessing the dugouts that you were testing in. Yeah, some of them were for sure. Um, okay. You should have, uh, I have some fun pictures of uh, <laughs> students <laughs> surrounded by cattle trying to sample. Um, <gasps> And uh, yeah, no, they're pretty good. So yeah, there. I think there are a lot of concerns. I, I think going back to that question about management as well, um, I think there's a lot of reasons to keep the cattle out. Um, the minute, you know, the cattle are in there and stomping around, uh, they're gonna be, you know, resuspending the sediments, the, the, those carbon stores are gonna be brought back up. Um, they're more available to be released as carbon dioxide or methane. Um, again, we, we did have some with cattle access and some without, um, but, uh, mm -hmm best practices would be to keep them out for a lot of reasons. So both the gases and the water quality for sure. Perfect, thanks for that answer. Um, Lyndon says, excellent information. Do you have the organism names that flourish under high sulfates um, versus those they outcompete? Mm. Um, so it's, I'm not a microbial uh, ecologist and I, I know Zora is here, it's on the, the call here, but sulfur reducing bacteria versus methanogens. Um, so it's all on the bacteria side of things, but I don't know um, specific names of things. Zora, if you want to jump in in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I know she was on the line earlier. I'm not sure yeah. if she's here, but Zora, if you're there, you're welcome to uh, to type in some answers if you have them. Um, that's all the questions we have at the moment. So um, I just want to remind our attendees that we'll be going to lunch break after this. Um, however, the poster session and trade show is still going on. So um, you can enjoy your... Uh, your lunch while you watch the poster videos or download resources at the trade show. Um, yeah, oh, Zora says that she can answer <laughs> later, like in many months. <laughs> she's, she's working on that. So she took a bunch of sediments uh, samples from our, our dugouts and wetlands last year and, and they're being analyzed right now, so. Okay, okay, awesome. Yeah. So yeah. maybe that's a presentation for our um, next, the 10th Native Prairie Restoration Reclamation Workshop You're in up, 2024. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, I guess that's everything for today. So, um, Carrie, thank you so much for, for joining our workshop and sharing your, your information with us and the really detailed presentation. And we had a lot of people type in that it was really great information. So thank you, Carrie. Thanks so much for the invite.
things. And to all of our attendees, be sure to check out the poster session trade show. There's still prizes going on for gamification. We have been recording this webinar. It will be uploaded in the near future. There is some processing time, so it might not be until this evening. And um, right now, PCAP is a bit of a two-man show, so it takes us a little bit of time. Um, we'll see you after lunch um, for the case studies. And you can choose a case study that you'd actively like to engage in. The student meet and greet is welcome. Everybody's welcome to join that. Anyone looking for employment activities, um, uh, job seekers, you're welcome to join in. And that one will not be recorded. So if you want to hop in there and get some information, we definitely recommend doing that because the student meet and greet will not be recorded. So with that, have a great lunch, everyone.